Ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good morning to you all, both uh, those of you who are here in the room with us, um, and also the many people who have tuned in uh, online through the web, uh, the web stream. My name is Andrew Ford. Many of you may know me. Uh, I'm responsible for the National Rural Development Policy at the Department of Rural and Community Development, and it's a huge pleasure for me today to be joined by my co-conspirator and partner in crime in all of this work, uh, Siobhan Cafferty, who works for uh, the Department of Justice and Pubble in relation to the Working for to Change strategy. Today, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, it's our fourth national social enterprise policy, uh, 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 social enterprise conference, should I say, uh, which is hard to believe uh, that four years have passed since yeah. the first, uh, since the policy was launched and how much has been achieved by all of you in that time. Um, today really is all about looking forward. Uh, the theme is uh, a new beginning, um, and I really want us to start the day thinking about the future and what our ambition uh, is for the future of this fantastic and vibrant and critically important sector. Um, but with that, I will hand over the floor now to Siobhan to say a few words of introduction. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. Let me just start by saying, happy Social Enterprise Day. Yay! <laughs> yes, we have to get that out there. The more we say that, the more, the bigger we are. Also, I want to welcome you to the Social Enterprise wedding. We're not quite so sure <laughs> who the bridal party is yet, but if you just make yourself known by the coffee break, that would be amazing. This is a huge honor, actually, for me to be here today. I think, you know, we, myself and and Andrew and the Department of Rural and Community Development have worked in collaboration on social enterprise to ensure that the sector really flourishes to be as inclusive as possible. Obviously, my, my work is with Pubble. I lead out on the Department of Justice working to change social enterprise and employment strategy. And in brief, that is a mechanism to get people with criminal histories into work. And I'm going to flip the thank yous Normally we do the thank yous at the end, bear with me. This is, this is a new one for Andrew as well. I, am, I just want to take this opportunity for you in the room, for social enterprises and those online who have already given people with criminal histories or those marginalised the access to employment and to education, to training. Thank you. I sincerely thank you. To also Minister Humphreys and your department, Andrew, the team, thank you for your support. You've been brilliant. But now it's my job to do the housekeeping. I see where the tables are. Thankfully, the naughty table down the back has been divided. <laughs> Some of you are up here. Today is about networking. It's about new beginnings. It's about new people in the room, getting to know those that have been in the social enterprise sector for a long time. If you see someone that you don't know, make sure you reach out. If you're someone who's here for the first time, Go talk to everybody, okay? That's what I would, I would say to you. Make sure that you use today as an opportunity to get to know the sector. We have a hashtag, so sent conference. It's on actually your name badge. Please do tweet. We need to share the, the success of the social enterprise sector and online media is a brilliant way of doing that. The Wi-Fi network, Hilton Honours, please do check in on that. Um, for those who are joining us virtually, of which we have over 200 people, that's phenomenal. Like, that's a huge number of people. Um, I would ask you to contribute in the chat box, which is open now. Fire exits are clearly marked. You'll see them there. The toilets, a little bit difficult to find, or so I found out. I had to pull back a curtain, otherwise none of you would have known where they were. Uh, but they are straight out that door. Straight, look straight ahead, and then they're down the stairs to the right. Coffee break, all important thing, half 11. You only have a little bit of time to wait until you get your next coffee, caffeine hit. As I said, the theme of today is about new beginnings. I would encourage you all at every opportunity to network. Get to know the people around you, particularly those whose faces are unfamiliar. Um, Andrew, over to you. Um, we have a very packed agenda today, as you've seen, because we want to make the absolute most of of the opportunity of being together. So we're going to get stuck straight in. And without further ado, it is now my great uh, pleasure and privilege to invite Minister for Rural and Community Development, Heather Humphreys, TD, to address the conference.
Well, good morning, everyone. And can I just say I'm delighted to, to welcome you to the fourth National Enterprise Conference. And it's wonderful to be here with you in person uh, today after two years of doing this uh, virtually. And I want to start by thanking you all for your tremendous work uh, uh, that you have been doing to serve communities, addressing disadvantage, and creating meaningful job opportunities over the past couple of years in very challenging circumstances. Our experience over the last three years and the manner in which we collectively responded demonstrates our resilience as a nation. And this is particularly true of social enterprises. But uh, we're not out of the woods yet. The war in Ukraine, Brexit, COVID, cost of living still looms large. At times uh, such as this, people continue to depend upon their communities as well as government for reassurance and for meaningful support. Social enterprises are often on the front line for communities throughout the country, providing goods and services, supporting our vulnerable citizens and creating jobs. The sector is growing at a rapid pace but we have a duty to maintain this positive momentum. And the theme of today's conference is a new beginning, which is very appropriate as we look to the future of this important sector in a very changing Ireland. The annual Social Enterprise Conference is a unique event in the social enterprise calendar. Its purpose is to create a space for networking, sharing of information and experiences, and most importantly, to seek your views uh, on policy implementation and development. As we start our day, I invite you all to reflect on where we are with social enterprise in Ireland. What is our collective ambition for the sector? And what can we all do to help us realize this ambition? Your opinions do matter to us and will be carefully considered. We have a full agenda ahead of us uh, with a, a rich array of distinguished speakers, which I hope will make this a very productive and enjoyable day. Colleagues, we have almost reached the end of Ireland's first national social enterprise policy. When my predecessor, Michael Ring, launched this policy four years ago, he described it as a defining moment for all who are working for a better Ireland. We have now reached another milestone as we seek to build on the tremendous progress achieved together and we look ahead to the next phase of the development of the sector. Where we go from here depends on how effectively we can shape an ambitious future, uh, an ambitious vision for our future. It must be innovative and inclusive, but it also must be practical and effective. For these reasons, we have already begun the process of co-producing Ireland's new National Social Enterprise Policy, which I hope to launch by mid-2023. My department will lead and drive this process forward in a spirit of continued partnership and with an open mind. Your voice does matter to us, and I urge you to engage with us to make sure the next policy delivers for you, because you're the people on the coal face, you're, you're working on the ground, so we want, to hear, we want to hear your experiences and we want to hear back from you. The past 12 months have seen significant progress right across the three pillars, uh, of course, raising awareness, growing and strengthening social enterprise and policy coherence. The Awareness Raising Initiative for Social Enterprises, known as ARISE, um, funded by my department, uh, made a huge contribution to raising the viability of social enterprises. Under the scheme, 1.2 million euro was invested, supporting 64 organisations nationwide. My department commissioned a consortium including SERI and the ILDN and Amoric Research to conduct the first national baseline data collection exercise of social enterprise in Ireland. And this is hugely important uh, because it provides the evidence base that we need to understand and to grow the sector. And I want to thank all the social enterprises and the networks who participated in the data collection survey, the results of which will be announced in the near future. 
We have continued the development of the Startup Social Enterprise Scheme in partnership with Rethink Ireland. And just last Monday, I attended the launch of the Social Enterprise Policy Bank in Monaghan, which is funded under our COVID-19 Social Enterprise Regeneration Programme, which has proven to be a critical support for many social enterprises in Monaghan, Cavan and Louth. And I just want to compliment them because they came together and they have developed templates now uh, for policies, for volunteers and all the plethora of things that you have to deal with. But this, these template policy documents I think will be very useful and uh, they can be um, uh, tapered to suit the needs or tailored to suit the needs of uh, the, the individual organisations because sometimes you know you have social enterprise, you have voluntary committees and there's, I know there's a lot expected of them uh, and uh, it's important that we give them all the supports that we can uh, to do their job effectively and uh, so, so I was glad to be able to do that uh, last Monday. Of course, my department also continues to invest significantly in supporting social enterprises through the Community Services Programme, uh, SICAP and LEADER. The 10 million Community and Voluntary Energy Support Scheme announced last, last week will support organisations which fall outside the parameters of the Temporary Business Energy Support Scheme. And these schemes, along with similar schemes for organisations in arts, sports, health, and Gaeltuck sectors recognise the pressures uh, that social enterprises and the community and voluntary sector are under due to rising energy costs. So it would be remiss of me not to mention the cross-governmental nature of work for social enterprise. The working to change social enterprise and employment strategy under the Department of Justice is having a profound impact on the lives of ex-offenders and supporting job opportunities in social enterprises. And I'm thrilled to see that uh, partnership on display here today with uh, Siobhan Cafferty, uh, the driving force behind the working, uh, the change strategy uh, emceeing she's at today's event alongside Andrew Ford, of course, from my own department. The Strategic Procurement Advisory Group, of which my department is a member, is helping uh, policymakers to better understand the transformative power of public procurement for the, advan the advancement of social policy objectives. The Department of the Environment, Climate and Communications uh, Circular Economy Innovation Grant Scheme includes a focus on social enterprises, recognising their key role in this area. While supports are being provided by the local enterprise offices and Enterprise Ireland, more needs to be done to ensure social enterprises have meaningful and consistent access to appropriate business supports. And last but not least, I have some further good news for you all today, and I'm delighted to announce an investment of almost 1.5 million euro to support 34 social enterprises the length and breadth of the country. The Scaling Up Fund will support these social enterprises to grow and develop their services, carry out capital works, purchase vehicles and other infrastructure projects. So in Limerick, for example, the funding we uh, are providing will develop a cafe that will provide uh, employment opportunities for people with autism. In Wexford, the funding will support the installation of an eight-person disabled access lift and in Dublin, the investment will purchase an electric vehicle for a mental health service. So this investment, I believe, will be transformative. And given the strength of interest in the scheme, I'll be announcing a further batch of successful projects in early 2023. So, colleagues, social enterprises continues to gain momentum uh, also at an international level. And Ireland is playing a very active role in that regard. We know we have a unique national experience of social enterprise and one that we are enormously proud of. However, we also have much to learn from other countries. And with that in mind, my department has partnered with the OECD to carry out an in-depth, independent, international review of the social enterprise policy. The OECD's uh, recommendations, which uh, you will get a flavour of shortly, will be carefully reviewed as we develop this new policy. And coming back to the theme of today's conference, now is the time for us all to reflect on priorities for the new 
National Social Enterprise Policy. And this afternoon's workshop promises to be very interesting and very engaging. And it'll be an opportunity for everyone to feed directly into the development of the policy. And over the coming months, there will be events around the country hosted in partnership with social enterprise networks. And the first of which will be held in Letterkenny next week, organised by the ILDN and Donegal Local Development Company. Other workshops will be held in Waterford, Limerick, Cork and Dublin over the next few weeks and uh, months. And there will also be an open public consultation in due course. This partnership approach is critical to our shared success. We need to be ambitious about the future of the sector, which continues to experience growth and has significant potential to create jobs and to continue to make a positive impact on society, the economy and the environment. So before I conclude, uh, I want to say the current social enterprise landscape in Ireland is unrecognisable from our starting point in 2019. And I am proud to have seen the tremendous contribution and impact social enterprises are making. I'm proud to, uh, and uh, I firmly believe that this sector can play a significant role in our society and the economy. We have the strong foundations in place. We now need to build on the continued success and we do need to all work together to make it happen. And that's why throughout um, my, my, while speaking today, I put a huge emphasis on hearing what you have to say on the ground. And uh, we'll collate all of that information and uh, we'll work with you on it. So listen, um, I, I hope you have a, a, an enjoyable day here. I think this is an exciting time for social enterprises. It's great to be involved with it. We can see the real changes that you're making on the ground. And uh, I, I was out in a social enterprise in North Monaghan a few weeks ago and they tell me they're the biggest supplier of meals on wheels in the whole country. They have 12 or 1,300 meals delivered every day. So I can tell you, you're making a real difference. And that's only just one, one example that I'm familiar with. There's loads more. Uh, and I better not tell you about all the ones in Monaghan or I'll get knocked off the stage. <laughs> I see Packy down there. <laughs> OK, thank you. Go on, Minister, thank you very much for your uh, wor very kind words and encouraging words and uh, your continued leadership uh, on this very important issue. Um, and I would just ask everybody to please excuse the Minister who has to leave us at this point. But thanks again, Minister, for, for uh, being with us this morning. I'll now hand over to Siobhan to take us to our next speaker. It's always great to start today with an announcement of 1.5 million. That's it. It doesn't get any better. No, I'm only joking. It does. I mean, I think um, I I'm, I'm have, a, again, a pleasure of, of inviting up the next speaker who, uh, you know, these things don't happen in a vacuum. And I think that, you know, the minister uh, has, has rightly highlighted the amount of work that goes on, the, the support that a sector like ours needs. Um, but let's not forget those that are in the department as well. And I think... Uh, I'm going to invite up Richard Gavin, who has a, been a huge player in supporting the social enterprise sector, to give us all an update, I suppose, from the technical side of things. Richard. Thank you very much, Siobhan. And good morning, everybody. Great to see so many familiar faces here again today. I'm going to split this into three different parts um, based on the three main objectives of our national policy. So I'm going to start with building awareness of social enterprise. Um, I'm hoping there's going to be a slide that you might be able to have a look at. If not, I have a, I have a, a copy here, luckily printed, just in case. <laughs> so I'm starting with uh, awareness raising. The minister mentioned it earlier, the Arise uh, scheme. Uh, this is addressing an issue that's one of the biggest challenges facing social enterprises and for developing the sector, and it's a lack of awareness out there. In fact, I, I was actually just talking to a social enterprise today, and they were telling me that they weren't actually aware they were a social enterprise until about a year into their, their activities. But there are a great selection of different projects uh, happening at the moment. 
Uh, last week, for example, I was in Kildare where the local partnership have uh, on their Rise programme, they're doing uh, radio uh, advertising. They've actually a brand uh, developed for social enterprise, a plaque to be placed on different social enterprises. They're also doing podcast and uh, promotional videos. So there's a lot of good things going on there with the Arise. And again, it's all just to raise, raise the awareness of the potential of social enterprise. So moving on to the, today's event uh, is another big uh, part of raising awareness. And uh, it gets people networking, gets people into the room, and just uh, it puts social enterprise out there. In fact, I'm aware of today, there's a, I think there's a TV program uh, uh, this morning covering a few social enterprises. And there's many other events taking place across the country. So it's really, as, uh, as Siobhan said earlier on, it's, it's National uh, Social Enterprise Day, and definitely a lot happening today across the country. Another big achievement uh, we're delighted to uh, mention is our collaboration with Faroiga. Uh, one of the actions in the policy is actually trying to get more young people involved in social enterprise. And we're delighted that we, we designed a, a module with Faroiga as part of their entrepreneurship training program. And uh, I'm more happy that we have many of the participants here today uh, who, who we'll be hearing a lot from uh, later on. But um, just to give an example, over 5,000 students participated in that module uh, last year. So it's definitely doing a good job on uh, raising awareness with young people in social enterprise. Also, the higher education network which we established, uh, its main function is, I suppose, to, to narrow the gap between researchers and policymakers ourselves. And we've had a, we have a number of meetings every year with uh, uh, researchers and academics, and it also encourages collaboration in the, the academic world uh, on the development of social enterprise. Uh, another initiative that uh, came from awareness raising, and it was actually from our awareness raising strategy, it was actually regular newsletters uh, on, uh, for social enterprises on updates and uh, uh, advice or case studies. And uh, we actually distribute them on a regular basis. If anybody wants to be part of the circulation list, uh, if they can just email, and we'll put this up on the, on the comments later, uh, senews at drcd.gov.ie, if you want to be included in the, the social enterprise newsletter. That's senews at drcd.gov.ie. So moving on then to the second uh, main uh, objective, which is growing and strengthening social enterprise. And the minister mentioned uh, ju just there about the latest uh, scheme on uh, capital grants provided by the Dormant Accounts Fund uh, on scaling up. Uh, but we're, we're delighted to say that since uh, the launch of the policy, we've been supporting social enterprises. Uh, over €5 million Euro has been provided for capacity building, helping social enterprises get off the ground, uh, develop their, their business uh, model. And in addition to that, we've also had great uh, work with uh, Rethink Ireland, who have a social enterprise development fund, among other funds, a startup fund as well, on helping social enterprises. And apart from financial uh, and ca capital supports, we also have arranged a number of uh, schemes to, to help with training and mentoring of social enterprise, which is a very important uh, need uh, for the sector. It's, it's also important to mention there's a number of other schemes in our department that uh, significantly uh, support social enterprise. There's the CSP scheme, uh, the SICAP, which incidentally last year uh, helped 500 uh, social enterprises, and there's the LEADER programme. So all of those uh, schemes providing very significant supports to, to social enterprises. Business-to-business uh, -business, uh, support is very important as well for social enterprises. We, we try to encourage collaboration with the business sector. And we, we collaborated with Chambers Ireland uh, last year on sponsoring an award for social enterprise uh, as part of their SGG uh, annual business awards. And that's, that's definitely uh, gained momentum. And again, it's increasing awareness and collaboration with the, the business community and social enterprise. And I'm glad to see we've, we've a representative from Chambers Ireland here today. The minister mentioned earlier on about the Strategic Procurement Advisory Group. Uh, this is where our department, uh, I suppose, flies the flag for social enterprise and tries to improve opportunities in the procurement area. Uh, so social enterprises can increase their trading and get, uh, I suppose, more of the, the, the public procurement uh, cake, I suppose you could say, that, that's available. Um, we're, we're constantly trying to, uh, I suppose, fly the flag there and uh, improve uh, opportunities. Uh, we've, we've, we've moved on a lot since we started, but obviously there's a lot, there's a lot more to be done there. 
But what I will say is we, we try to, to lead by example uh, and to set an example of to use social enterprises in procurements as much as possible. And just a, a couple of examples. Uh, today, we're, we're using Can Do Social Enterprise, which is a very good social enterprise from Dublin, uh, to provide some small uh, gifts for some of our speakers today. Uh, also, our department uses uh, local social enterprises to provide with catering. And actually, earlier on this year, we used Fantastic when we were organising the British Irish Council event. I'm also glad to say that we hope to be very soon, uh, in collaboration with the Department of Justice, uh, the OGP and Pubble, we hope to be publishing a tender on socially responsible public procurement research, just to kind of find, about, find more about international best practice in this area and whether we can apply it in Ireland. Uh, we've also uh, published as well on our uh, website, on, on gov.ie, a uh, supports table for social enterprise, listing basically um, uh, financial and non-financial supports that are available for social enterprise. So I'd advise any social enterprise here to, to keep a regular eye on that. So I'm going to move on now to the, the third uh, main objective, which is achieving better policy alignment. And again, uh, the minister mentioned earlier on the data collection exercise, and this was a very big uh, priority for our policy. We basically had, uh, I'm glad to see the slide <laughs> making an appearance anyway, but we, we, we basically had uh, completely li very little data on social enterprise in Ireland. And as many of the social enterprise here would know, we've actually just completed a, a survey which is feeding into a report on data. Uh, for, for social enterprise. We're delighted that we got over 800 uh, responses to that. So I know that Amoric Research, Siri, and the ILDN are, are working hard now and just, uh, I suppose, putting all that into, uh, into, a, into a report. And again, that'll help us with developing the, the, the new policy. It'll also help us when we, when we go to other departments trying to uh, explain the role that social enterprises play in, for example, climate action, in uh, poverty or employment as well, because it, it'll show where the, what sectors social enterprises are working in. We, we try to align as well, and we've, we've had good success with aligning social enterprise with many of our national policies. Uh, for example, rural development, our rural future, makes explicit reference to social enterprise, as does uh, policies in climate action, the, the justice uh, working to change, as was mentioned earlier as well. And also our department fed into the development of the, the white paper on enterprise. And this is very important just to outline the, 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 the clear role that social enterprise has to play in, in, in enterprise policy in Ireland. Also, our department sits on steering groups for regional enterprise plans and clustering policies, again showing the role and the key, the key um, uh, potential of social enterprises in those areas. And on the, on the, on the subject of, of regional development, uh, we've worked, collaborated with Udras uh, uh in putting together their strategy on social enterprise and a support scheme which was announced earlier on this year for supporting social enterprises in, in those regions. Also, we've worked, uh, with, like I've worked with the WDC as well on social enterprise, and they've done some good work recently on, on developing the sector. And uh, finally, just mentioned there the Midwest Regional Enterprise Plan. We're going to hear f about that later on today. But that's a great example of uh, showing, in fact, why we're covering that is because one of the key actions in it is developing local social enterprises uh, in that region, in the Midwest region. So we're definitely delighted to see that, and we, we'd hope that that will be the first of many regional enterprise plans uh, covering the social enterprise. Uh, the Minister mentioned earlier on about the whole area of international engagement. And uh, we're active uh, with the EU expert group on social enterprise. Uh, we actually fed in as well to the, the EU action plan on social economy, uh, which uh, social economy obviously includes social enterprises along with cooperatives and mutuals. But there's definitely a growing momentum of, uh, of work happening on, on the, the EU side, and Ireland are, are feeding into it uh, directly. Uh, the OECD was mentioned as well. Uh, we're doing a review. There's a review uh, almost complete on social enterprise implementation in Ireland. And that again will feed into the development of the, the policy uh, next year. We, we'll give it a uh, consideration to the recommendations that uh, come from that. We also work with the OECD as well. We fed into a, a recommendation that they, they published um, uh, uh, last or uh, a few months ago on social enterprise. And it's definitely in, uh, improved uh, or increased momentum there uh, on the international uh, stage. Uh, also international on the UN, there's a UN General Assembly 
uh, resolution on social economy being drafted. And Ireland, again, have fed into that, uh, as we've also fed into the International Labour Organization conference uh, recently on social enterprise, which produced a paper on the potential of uh, the social economy. Uh, closer to home, we had an event earlier this year, a shared island event in Monaghan, which had social enterprise as one of the main uh, items on the agenda. And that got great interest from both sides of the border, some great examples of, uh, of social enterprises, both sides. And uh, we're happy that we've, we've great uh, relations with our, with our, uh, our counterparts uh, in Northern Ireland. And I'm glad to see uh, Stephen here today uh, joining us. Uh, and that's through the British Irish Council, uh, which is actually, it's, it's an organisation or it's, a, it's an entity, I suppose, under the Good Friday Agreement. And there's a work sector on that, on social enterprise. Uh, we, we actually held a symposium in March this year on uh, social enterprise and on social value and how social value uh, is a driver for social enterprise. And that was attended by uh, participants from Northern Ireland, Scotland, England, Wales, uh, and the other members of the British Irish Council. And more recently, just last month, there was a ministerial meeting in Cardiff uh, where we presented a paper on the development of social enterprise in the, the BIC, the British Irish Council uh, member states. So almost finished up, so just, uh, just a, a couple of uh, uh, just points. Um, obviously, it's important as well to have oversight and reporting of of the developments on social enterprise. So we do publish annual reports and uh, we intend to have uh, the annual report for 2021 published uh, over the next uh, uh, week or so. Uh, and also as well, we have regular implementation group meetings with key stakeholders. We have a number of them every year uh, from different government departments, from social enterprises and from the social enterprise networks. So that's basically the, the technical update on the implementation of the social enterprise policy. So thanks very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, it's actually quite hard to believe that so much has been achieved in a four-year period, especially when you think that we had, let's just call it a blip, uh, that international blip in between. Um, it's a real testament to the team and to all of you that so much has been achieved. I mean, Richard really could have kept going there and said all the in, in little bits and pieces of other stuff that have happened. But even this week alone, Andrew mentioned it earlier, like if you look, just look at, at Twitter, I don't know, I almost have to mute my, my Twitter account. There's just so much stuff, really positive stuff happening. We've got by social week, we've got all of this type of stuff happening. And it's, it's just fantastic to see and how, how visible it is and how it's getting traction. So I think let's, let's keep that up. Um, so yes, yeah, so thank you, uh, Richard. Um, next, I would like to introduce someone who is, how can I describe her, um, a dynamo. Uh, if you've had the pleasure of working with this lady uh, and your social enterprise has been supported by her. You know all about it. She is absolutely fantastic. And I often say that the social enterprise sector is the backbone of Irish society, but sometimes that backbone needs support. Um, and Michelle Licardi is gonna come up now in a moment and speak about the Irish Local Development Network of which there's 49 local development companies. Michelle is a social enterprise manager for the for Dublin South City Partnership, who is one of those. Um, and the work that Michelle does is just phenomenal on behalf of the partnership, on behalf of ILDN. So Michelle is going to give us a quick update on the supports available through that network. Thank you, Siobhan. That's very flattering. Um, it's a privilege to have an opportunity to speak today on behalf of all of our social enterprises and the ILDM. Today, we have an opportunity to build a shared understanding between policymakers and all of the social enterprises regarding your role in economic and social value creation and the inclusive economies we all want to see. But in order to achieve that, we will need to disrupt the current economic models and the business models that we easily accept to more open, transparent, and participatory models that consider the needs and wishes that we can all see in our local communities on a regional level and a national level. To make this change for a new beginning, which is what today is all about, it needs to be underpinned by substantial and extensive targeted investments capable of sustaining recovery and competitiveness in the social economy. We need to ensure everyone in this room is equipped to champion social enterprise 
and to broaden the conversation between social entrepreneurs and all of our target audiences. We have learned that it can often be social enterprises are focusing on the social mission and they miss other opportunities, but they need the support from everybody in this room to champion all of the balls they're trying to juggle in the air. We have witnessed unprecedented levels of collaboration across our communities since the pandemic. But as Siobhan has mentioned, that blip has derailed a lot of progress, as in Siobhan said, sorry, but the blip, but it has derailed a lot of progress that we're seeing in our communities. We are now at a critical junction. It's been 10 years since the first submission was made for the Forfus report. Enormous progress has been made, thanks to everybody in this room and all the work that they are doing, and especially for everybody from the DRCD, with the first social enterprise policy and the strategy. We all comment when we meet at events like this or throughout the last couple of years in a hybrid environment on the commitment and the calibre of the social enterprises we are supporting, their social missions, their social return on investment, and what they are achieving on a daily basis despite all the odds and all the barriers they face. But I'm asking you now to participate with us today in finding a way to move the dial and to progress from piecemeal approaches. Our social enterprises are asking for a coherent and interconnected ecosystem that will empower them to unleash their true potential. Dublin South City Partnership have been collaborating with six other local development companies as a consortium in order to maximise our funding submissions and impact. I wear many hats and today I'm talking on behalf of the ILDN and all of our local development companies. The Arise, funded through the DRCD, for example, has hugely benefited all of us in the last year, including the ILDN with Socialize, a number of other local development companies, and a number of our own social enterprises who availed of Strand 1 and are in this room today. Through targeted focus groups and our evaluations of previous training and mentoring supports, we launched the hashtag GetSocialDublin campaign, which provided media training, coverage, radio adverts, social media, podcasts, videos, guides, which were all targeted at very differentiated target audiences. So what did we discover? There's a number of potential successes lie within this sector, but what we need is to formalize the sector and to open up now a mature dialogue. We need to establish a national knowledge bank and directory. We need to produce engaging content to keep audiences engaged on an ongoing basis as it's fast evolving. And we need to unlock support and investment. What were the learnings and challenges? Social enterprise networks are overstretched and under-resourced. We need to rapidly establish and deploy a coordinated social enterprise brand for Ireland. We need engagement and participation of all the other non-social enterprise stakeholders because most of us in this room know how important social enterprise is to the Irish economy. We need to be telling everybody else. In order to do this, we need to reduce the silos and the duplication of effort and expenditure. So what do we recommend? We'd like to leverage the initial investment, the learnings and resources that all of the funding in the last couple of years and to build cumulatively on what we have learned and what we have amongst everybody in this room and for everybody that's online today. We would like to see a unified movement for social enterprises in order to maximize collaboration and the shared learnings. Often we are so busy, myself, all of my peers across the LDN and all of our social enterprises that we're struggling to actually share the information that we have and because we're so busy working on the job. We need to look at the strategic use of funds and the alleviation of burdens at a local level. I can often participate where I'm speaking from a Dublin-based or an urban level, but I'm meeting with colleagues who are working at a, a rural and maybe under leader project, but we have lots to learn and sh from each other. And finally, to access our fair share of EU social economy funding. We support a number of work integration social enterprises, and some are in the room here today. And it's always extremely difficult to highlight all of their social impact, as not only are they trying to achieve multiple social missions, but equally, they're trying to provide wraparound supports to their employees. So they have their social missions on one side, and then often a large part of their employees require a high level of support. And often the end consumer or a procurer or a corporate will not realize that this is the case. I understood very recently at an event that this is a misconception in social enterprise because somebody that was there to support us from a corporate was telling us, could we stop mentioning the social mission and perhaps focus more on the profit side? But I disagree. I think we need to find a middle ground for our profit with purpose.
We need to shout out loud about the social returns on investment and the multiplier effect we see daily on the individuals, their families and their communities. Two years ago, during the pandemic, a social entrepreneur said they'd spotted an opportunity. We did a feasibility study with them, matched them with mentors, sent them on some of our training and introduced them to national organisations, who incidentally now are some of their biggest clients. They managed throughout the pandemic to launch three different programmes. One was with schools, whereby they were opening up a dialogue where people could see that difference is not a deficit, so our future generation will not accept what we have accepted. They managed to launch a retail element for a cohort that is often excluded, so that they could also progress their careers, when often they had great talent but nobody was looking. And they also offered a career and lifestyle training option. And they managed to pivot and turn all of this online during the pandemic and be able to keep going. The atmosphere in the room was pure joy, and it's the reason why I get up every morning and continue to work in social enterprise, because when I see the impact and the social impact we are having, all of the participants and stakeholders, and most of those who we are excluding in society are in that room, and to see that we've come through a pandemic, and it is time for a new beginning. So where do we go from here? What is their vision for the sector? Staffing and upskilling. We've mentioned today about CSP, Constantly when the local development companies were struggling how to manage with CSP or if there's going to be a new offering. I currently have a number of social enterprises who would love to look at another form of CSP. We have TUS and we have community employment. We need to look at a national training for social economy staff and we need to bring SkillsNet and the ETB awareness to the table. And look at options for New Frontiers and Acorns and a number of other training options. We need more awareness, where Richard has mentioned today, about the clusters in Ireland, if it can be shared, and that often there's great learning going on and expertise held in these in a geographical or within a certain area where there's a specific type of expertise. We need an understanding of social return on investment and how to capture that from day one, because often social enterprises are struggling to backtrack and say when they're applying for a fund or trying to show their impact where they know it in their head, but it's very hard often to capture that on paper. We need to look at a shared service hub for key services. We have a number of Swedish and Danish Nordic examples, and this is where every day I would get an incoming call for legal advice, for HR advice, and sometimes from administrative or marketing advice. And often social enterprises, this is where they're falling over and, and failing. We need a forum for disseminating of information and knowledge at a national, a regional, and a local level so we can be flexible. A dream would be to have a 2023 calendar of events of all social enterprises from a national, regional and local level so, and also international events so we can all plan accordingly and decide how to best place our time and prioritise our workloads. A directory that could be used for business to business, for consumers and for procurers. A lot of our core founders are asking for salaries to be secured as they're really struggling in the first three years of launching their social enterprise. And finally, the multi-annual funding streams and other financial instruments about which I believe we're going to hear more today. And I also thank the Minister's announcement today of a new fund, which I'm hoping will help us achieve all of this. I'm hoping today that we can reach some consensus on how we accelerate the platform economy, whilst not ignoring local and social value chains, as well as the importance of the green, circular and digital transformation and the part Tech for Good has to play for all of us. As mentioned by the Minister as well earlier, we need to strengthen Ireland's economic resilience in what we're facing in a very unsure future economy. Unfortunately, as we all know here today, there is no quick fix or silver bullet, but we have so many great examples already in Ireland and globally. Recently, I had requested a number of social enterprises were asking for legal advice. And so after a lot of swings and roundabouts, I managed to contact a legal firm that I believe specialised in social enterprises. The quotes they sent me, certainly no local development company could help pay towards, and no social enterprise, or at least 95% of our clients would not be able to afford. We need to open up the conversation when we see in Northern Ireland that Mayor from Now Group is working with Get Briefed on the Honesty Box campaign, whereby a social enterprise can avail of the legal advice for at, a, at a price that they can afford, or a corporate can find a way, if they don't want to come and do something else, that they pay for the advice and they then say, I'll offer forward for a social enterprise or a charity to avail of the same benefit. What we learned in the podcasts for the Get Social campaign was that a number of corporates really want to play a part and a number of procurers, but they often misunderstand social enterprises. 
So they may offer to come on a team building day and then they want to just give a donation. But what the social enterprise is actually looking for is that they want to align their value and missions and look at longer term collaborations. It may be inviting somebody with a skill onto their board. It may be support on a specific tender or project. Or it may be having somebody as a sounding board but with a longer term commitment or match funding for some big fund they have to apply for. It's time to level up and close the capacity and the skills gap in the social enterprise sector. We need concrete commitments from the policymakers in this new strategy. And social enterprises need to challenge the established systems as they have the potential to contribute over 10% to GDP and employ people who otherwise are constantly excluded. I look forward to collaborating with you all. Thank you, Michelle. I told you she was brilliant, didn't I? Um, if I was to reflect, there was so much in that, so many brilliant recommendations, Michelle. Thank you for taking the time on behalf of ALDN to, to share those recommendations. And many of them, obviously, you know, I think all of us in this room know that operating social enterprise isn't easy. You know, it is not easy. It's far from easy, yet we continue to do it. And we need those supports, and we need those considered supports. And I'll, I'll just end with, with the statement that you had, it's time to level up. Let's level up. Let's use, use today as an opportunity to do those new beginnings. So absolutely think of everything that Michelle said for the afternoon session. Now I'm going to hand over to Andrew. Thanks very much, uh, Siobhan. Uh, and earlier, Minister Humphreys noted that we have uh, partnered with the OECD to carry out uh, an in-depth policy review of the first social enterprise policy in Ireland. We felt this is the appropriate way to get a really objective um, uh, opinion based on international best practice on what has gone well and where we need to maybe go from here. Um, so without further ado, if the technology is in place, uh, I would like to warmly invite um, our dear friend and colleague, uh, Amal Chevreau, and I think she's supported by her own colleague, Meli Saslan, uh, to give us a, a flavor, Amal, of your pre preliminary findings from your report. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. I was really hoping to come to Ireland because I had the, the chance and the opportunity to visit your wonderful country three times this year so far. But we, we couldn't because today we, we, we have also our committee meeting, the Local Employment and Economic Development uh, Committee meeting, the first time in person since the end of the uh, pandemic. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, share with you, as Andrew uh, has said, uh, the, the, the flavor of the, our first findings and preliminary recommendations for the National Policy on Social Enterprises. And and I have to say that for us, Ireland is extremely interesting as a, as a country and of course also is, is also an inspiring country and context for social enterprises. I mean, it's just wonderful that you have a national social enterprise conference and compared to other OECD countries, you're, believe me, even if the, the, the policy um, was adopted in just 2019, there are a lot of very good developments in Ireland and, of course, a lot of room for improvement. So uh, if I can have the uh, presentation up, I could start sharing with you the findings uh, of the review. So, um, for us, it was it's always very important to understand the the, the whole context of a country before diving in the specific um, uh, sector that we uh, are zooming in. So, for us, it's very also it, it's it's also very important to place this whole debate about uh, social enterprises within the national. Uh, context or the, the socio-economic context of Ireland. So first of all, uh, we always look into what are the strengths, what are the challenges that the country is facing. And these are also, these challenges and these strengths are also very relevant for social enterprises for the number of reasons that you have heard from the minister and for the wonderful speakers that, and Richard, of course, and the, the, the lady who spoke before me was just fantastic on, on really summarizing the, the, the elements that are also important for social enterprises. So first of all, um, 
Ireland is, is now amongst the most prosperous countries in, in Europe with a very open and highly globalized economy. This comes, of course, with a lot of benefits, but a lot of challenges as well. And Ireland, Ireland has managed also to um, respond effectively to the pandemic and is projected also to sustain a GDP growth this year and next year, despite many crises facing the global economy. So, um, the, the social enterprises, and we have heard, you have heard, and I, I unfortunately I couldn't listen to the minister's address at the beginning, um, but uh, Ireland is host to a very dynamic social enterprise um, uh, um, uh, scene and landscape, uh, but also uh, this landscape is, is responding to challenges uh, such as, for instance, an aging population, uh, population aged over 25 is estimated to grow more rapidly in Ireland than other than most OECD countries. Of course, you have also, um, I'm saying of course, although I, I, I I regret saying that, but you also face labor force participation challenges, especially among youth and regional disparities. And we have just released a huge report on uh, regions at a glance, as we call it, we, which, which outline also and highlight the, the, the difference, differences among regions within countries within the OECD. So uh, you have all these uh, strong economic uh, indicators, uh, persistent challenges, but also, as I said, a very dynamic uh, ecosystem for social entrepreneurship marked by, and I was really impressed when I was when I visited that Ireland with that with this uh, uh, culture or, or of 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 activism towards the community. You have a huge and a strong sense uh, of community and of serving the community. That's very widespread in Ireland, and this is a very fertile ground for social enterprises. We also in the OECD insist on um, countries uh, fostering, for instance, social entrepreneurship or social economy in a more globally culture. And you do have that because there is a sense of community within your country. Um, and all these uh, community initiatives and uh, higher participation, participation of involuntary work has also uh, been able to support provision of welfare uh, and labor market integration of those who are at disadvantage in Ireland. So let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, here, we uh, in the report, we, we also highlight uh, that there is a need for conceptual clarity around what is social economy, what is social enterprises, and what is social innovation. We've adopted, as Richard said in his uh, brief introduction, that we, ha we adopted a recommendation in June uh, 2022, in which we outline what the OECD for our constituency, how we see social economy, what is social economy made of, and of course, social enterprises are made, uh, are part of the social uh, economy wider landscape. So social, social enterprises, as you define it, and we define it the same way, are entities that trade goods and services, but also fulfill a social and increasingly also a green mission. So um, uh, this is also the case uh, in the national policy in Ireland. This is how the, the concept is defined the, in the same way. And of course, you in, in, in your, in your uh, policy, you also insist on social innovation. So I'm not going to go into this whole conceptual debate because we can spend hours on it and it's very interesting. But it's just to, to uh, highlight the fact that social enterprises are usually part of a wider spectrum of social economy organizations. And this is the case also in Ireland. Next slide, please. So now I'm going into the nitty gritty. Uh, in, the, in the report, we uh, look into many policy areas where we highlight the strengths and the challenges that we have observed in, um, in Ireland. Uh, as far as social enterprise development is concerned. So for instance, uh, for the inst institutional and legal framework for social enterprises, we did note that um, the institutional framework for social enterprises in Ireland has, been po has positively evolved with institutions that are, um, how can I say it, clearly dedicated to supporting 
uh, social enterprises development, such as, uh, of course, the Department of Rural and Community, uh, as, uh, but other departments as well contribute into that effort. So you have a national uh, institu national institutions working on social um, enterprise development, but also at the regional level and even at city level. So there is. Um, a strong also alignment with other national policies, such as the uh, uh, policies on the uh, on the justice front, uh, rural development policies, and other and creating jobs and employment policies. And this is remarkable because we we have observed and then that in other OECD countries that is not the case. So this is one of the strengths of the the institutional uh, framework uh, for social enterprises in Ireland. But on the other hand, on the legal front, there is still this some sort of a, um, a persistent challenge about the real legal identity of social enterprises. So. In Ireland, you have a broad spectrum, spectrum of legal forms that are offered to social enterprises. They can adopt any legal form they want, but they also choose to uh, attach the charity status to it because that's a way for them to benefit from um, fiscal uh, benefits, although not exclusively. But that also creates uh, a challenge because as probably you will hurt your, uh, throughout the day, this creates some sort of a confusion about what is a social enterprise. Is it really a company? Is it really a charity? Or is it both? And this creates, uh, and this is not just specific to Ireland, to be honest, because we have studied this year about, and we have published a manual on legal frameworks, for instance, on 10, uh, in 10 um, EU countries. And this is a persistent confusion in all these countries. So these are the challenges very good institutional uh, framework that's moving forward this momentum for social enterprises in Ireland, but also uh, as much as there is such flexibility in, in, in terms of choosing options for legal for a legal form, this comes also with a challenge, which is what is really a, a social enterprise. Next slide, please. Access to finance and funding. So you've heard a lot of speakers, and I think you will hear throughout the day that this is a real challenge. And uh, uh, it's a real challenge in many countries, in many OECD countries, but also in, uh, in, in uh, more globally. We have observed that also in, in, uh, in uh, for instance, in countries such as Brazil, Mexico, and so on. Uh, the, the access to finance is something that's very difficult for social enterprises compared to conventional uh, enterprises. Why? Because first of all, and that goes back to the first challenge, a lot of conventional fi financiers do not understand their legal form. They do not understand that they have uh, a social mission as well. But of course, in Ireland, uh, you have increased momentum also for uh, funding and financing social enterprises. So you have a lot of um, initiatives that were uh, 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 mentioned uh, during uh, Richard's address, such as the community service program, social enterprise measure of the dormant account fund, social innovation fund. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you do have uh, specific, you have, you have put in place specific funding and finance um, um, schemes, but it is still not a very, I mean, mainstream finance is still not very widely open for social enterprises in Ireland. And again, that is not just typical of, of Ireland. That's something that we have observed in many OECD countries. Next slide, please. Access to markets. Well, that's uh, another big issue. Um, Usually social enterprises, and it's not for you that I will explain this, but I will say it nevertheless, because we still need to explain what the concept is, is about. Social enterprises deeply contribute to addressing specific social issues such as poverty, social exclusion, and employment. At the same time, they trade goods and services. So if you are a social enterprise and you go see a conventional bank, it's, it's very difficult to explain these two things. But a lot of countries are driving momentum so that this whole uh, concept is, is, is better understood. So access to markets has been recognized in the, the national policy, the national social enterprise policy for Ireland with an objective to improve access to public markets, including 
public sector contracts, business markets, and consumer markets for social enterprises. And you have initiatives, for instance, uh, uh, public procurement for social enterprises can be a significant enabler. And this is why uh, I think it, we think that it was a good initiative that the Irish Office of Government Procurement published in 2018 an information note on incorporating social considerations in public procurement. So this is something promising and uh, Ireland could probably go on uh, and even have a, a bi-social act if possible. So um, I think um, driving public contracts into smaller lots or uh, so that smaller scale social enterprises can apply could be one of the options. Uh, so that, uh, but also helping social enterprises of uh, get the necessary knowledge to participate in public tenders could also help them access um, public markets, but also private markets. Uh, next slide, please social impact measurement and data provision. Well, social um, impact measurement is, you know, a whole issue uh, on its own. Uh, a lot of social enterprises, as a lot of social economy organizations are about impact and more specifically social impact. And they are more, and, and these organizations are increasingly under pressure to document their social and environmental impact by policymakers, financiers, and other stakeholders. Um, the National Social Enterprise Policy in Ireland has shown some progress in establishing guidance. And for instance, we can recall uh, that in 2016, the Department of Public Expenditure and before published the Social Impact Assessment Framework to serve as a reference point to understand the impact of budgetary policy decisions. And of course, you also have um, uh, initiatives taken at the regional level, such as um, uh, the initiative launched by the Western Development Commission uh, to survey uh, the, the social enterprises to better capture their size, scale, and social impact as well. So these are very promising and very good initiatives that Ireland uh, is taking. Uh, having said that, the challenge is linked to the second element, which is data provision. I mean, it, 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 many countries are still struggling with establishing evidence and data. And I know that you have been conducting a survey to know the size, the real size of the of social enterprises, at least to capture most of them and to know in which activities they, they, they are active, they, what are the activities that they are conducting, the sectors where in which they are more active and so on. So it, to help the first part of uh, social impact measurement, you need more data provision, you need more to collect more information about social enterprises. So these two things uh, are, go hand in hand together. And of course, because usually social enterprises are very, not very big, but they tend to be small to medium. They lack resources and capacity to uh, measure their, their impact. So they need also uh, support and they, they need public incentives to measure their impact. Next slide, please. Skills and business development. I think uh, here uh, also when I uh, when we when we were in Ireland and we had the, the chance to speak with many uh, stakeholders, uh, the, the, this was also identified as a strength, of course, of many uh, social uh, enterprises in Ireland, but also uh, a challenge since um, there aren't enough trainings for people who are running social enterprises to, to run them as a proper uh, business, uh, by barriers also to financial sustainability and um, uh, fragmented capacity building and human cap capital enhancement programs are much needed. So, um, uh, social enterprises can can run a business, but also fulfill their their uh, social mission. Next slide, please. So now the fun part. I think that to sum it, and I think you know your context, you know what you need, but you know also you need also um, uh, international inspiration, and this is what the OECD is about. This is what the best that we can offer you. I think that. Um, you can look into many examples to cover this whole policy areas uh, of the, the, the ecosystem for social enterprises uh, so that 
what happened in other countries, of course, should not be replicated as it is in Ireland, but could inspire just to um, fine tune certain things that you are already doing. So, for instance, first of all, uh, we need to clarify, because I, I mean, in Ireland, we speak more about social enterprises than social economy in general. Maybe there is a need to clarify a little bit more the, these two concepts in the context of Ireland. And it could be interesting, for instance, to look at other what other countries have done. So, for instance, Bulgaria has created since 2010 a working group on social economy that supports uh, the whole institutional uh, framework of the country to better understand uh, what the different concepts are and what the different organizations are and how they can be clearly uh, identified and separated. Uh, cl clarifying legal frameworks. I think this is something that's going to be recurrent. Um, and this is, again, not something specific to Ireland. Uh, so clarifying the legal identity of what social enterprises are is extremely important because these are proper businesses. They trade goods and services, but at the same time, they help uh, solve a lot of market failures, social failures. So how do we help them gain this visibility as a business while giving them also the space to fulfill their mission? So for instance, most countries with exceptions, uh, such as the UK uh, through the uh, community interest companies, most countries adopt what we call a label or a status that's high, that recognizes a social enterprise by certain criteria and uh, offers the, the, the advantage of having many legal options offered to social enterprises. But with these clear criteria, such as, for instance, the ESUS uh, status in France, these legal, the, the social enterprises are better identified. The other thing that goes hand in hand with legal frameworks or legal options is also to clarify uh, the, the institutional framework. So for instance, I can give you the example of Colombia where they've created what they call the superintendence of uh, so, uh, solidarity economy because this is how they call it over there. And this is something that oversees everything that that is related to social economy, including uh, social enterprises. It this 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 body has uh, the, the the ability to coordinate action across levels of government and across sectors. And this is something that maybe could, I mean, we have observed that in many cases clarifies this, the institutional framework for this specific type of business. So that could be something uh, that could. Um, uh, you know, could be considered uh, for um, the issue of uh, public funding. Of course, you have a lot of examples such as UK's Big Society Capital, which is a financial institution in the UK dedicated to social impact investment in the UK. Next slide, please. And of course, other um, um, practices around, uh, other examples around access to markets, such as, for instance, uh, the Victoria Social Procurement Framework uh, that was um, adopted to specifically help social enterprises access uh, uh, markets uh, in, in, the, in the state of Victoria in Australia, Buy Social in Scotland, the, 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 the initiative of Buy in Social, Canada's Montreal Social Economy, I buy initiative and so on. So, and of course, you have other examples from other countries. I don't want to be too long and I'm happy to take uh, questions, but these are examples that could inspire um, targeting the, the policy sector areas uh, dedicated to, to social enterprises in the national policy with um, schemes and measures and initiatives really tailored to social enterprises because as you all know and i've heard that so many times when i come to when i came to ireland social enterprises are a very important contributor to many uh, important agendas in in uh, in ireland the green agenda uh, work and integration agenda the social agenda so i think uh, you you are on the right path and this is uh, compared to other 
OECD countries and other international uh, experiences. Uh, and everything, there is also a room uh, for improvement. We need to work together. The, uh, the, the issue of data is, 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 is very important and the OECD is very happy to uh, support Ireland in, the, in that effort and also in making the national policy a lot more uh, compelling in, uh, in, uh, within the next uh, couple of years so that social enterprises in Ireland could grow and thrive even more. So thank you very much and very happy to take questions. Uh, sincere thanks, Amal, for that, that very helpful overview. And I think uh, you'll all hopefully agree with me that this has been an extraordinarily beneficial partnership so far. And we look forward to working with you to finalise the report and indeed to work on the uh, delivery in the next policy cycle. Um, I, we have a few minutes. If there are any questions or comments anybody would like to share uh, while we have the benefit of, of, of Amal's presence, um, Put your hand up, please, and I will run with the microphone. Okay, we have one question over here. Sorry. Yeah, do you mind? Is that working? Yeah. Good morning, and thank you so much for a really good um, uh, whistles top tour, and I look forward to reading the uh, report. Helen McGurk from Munster Technological University. Um, I wonder, um, do you have any comment about training education in this area uh, of uh, social enterprise and social economy? Thank you. If, if, if uh, just for efficiency's sake, we might take a couple of questions together if there are more questions. I see another hand over there. If that's okay with you, Amal. Yes, of course. Okay, thank you. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm just, I'm just hoping that the technology works. Can I just offer, if I may, a slight correction about what OECD unfortunately continues to perpetuate about the myth of the community interest company, which was introduced in the UK in 2004. It isn't a specific social enterprise company registration. It is simply an add-on when you register as a company limited by shares, a company limited by guarantee, or even a co-op, you can add it on as a feature, but if I may say so, it is not and has never been a specific social enterprise registration. Thank that's, you for the clarification. That, that, we that's might unfortunately a myth that keeps getting perpetuated. Oh, okay, thank you very I'm much. Just in the interest of time, we might continue, please, uh, if there are any other questions. No, okay, Amal, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I'll start with the last comment. Thank you very much for the correction and we will take it on board. Thank you very much. Helen, really thank you for the question. I think that we, we've had an expert discussion yesterday about how to better implement the, uh, or to help countries implement the recommendation of, uh, adopted by the OECD on social economy that also includes, of course, um, social enterprises. The element of training and education will be and are treated and analyzed in the context of Ireland with examples from other countries uh, in the report. We think it's very important. We have been insisting uh, in our work here at the OECD uh, to, on, on the importance of including social entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship skills, although these still need to be better defined. And we've released recently, uh, just last week, a report on social enterprises that are led by young people. And we've tried to touch upon this specific question of training and education. When does training need to happen? When does education need to happen so that people can be social entrepreneurs and good social entrepreneurs, meaning they could run a business and at the same time, uh, fulfill whatever social or green mission they wish. So I think that uh, we, we, we do take this uh, point very seriously. We have a lot of good examples coming from a lot of countries on, on, on how they integrate this element. 
uh, and we definitely will include it. And it is actually already included in the report. So, and if you have anything uh, to for us to look into that maybe we have overlooked, please share uh, this, and we will be more than happy to look at it. Uh, just before I maybe um, uh, leave you here, because we have another committee, and I have to run back. I would like to thank you very, very much all for, for your time and for listening to us. Uh, the OECD is very much looking forward to uh, completing this report and launching it with, uh, with Ireland. I would like also to thank Andrew, Richard, their team uh, for their great collaboration, great sense of community also on this project. So thank you all and I wish you and we wish you from the OECD a very good national uh, uh, social enterprise conference. Sincere thanks, Samal. <laughs> Sincere thanks, uh, Amal, for that. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand the floor to uh, Siobhan Cafferty to take us to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Amal. Um, it's actually a really nice segue into this section, actually. Amal, Amal mentioned something there, actually jotted it down. Uh, she said, you know, that it's, it's really difficult to, for, for social enterprises to access finance. Um, I'd like to invite the next two speakers up. Um, uh, I hope I get the surname correct, the pronunciation. Mario Votero, who is the Impact Director at Rethink Ireland, and Donald Trainer, the Group CEO of Community Finance Ireland, to speak about their hybrid model of finance. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. My name is Mario Otero. I'm the Impact Director at Rethink Island. And we are here talking about new ideas. And today, we want to share with you and announce a new financial product to keep supporting social enterprises across Ireland. Just before that, I just want to say thank you very much to the department, to Richard, to Andrew and the whole team to be in supporting us from the beginning in this project. And just before talking about the product, I want to share with you a little bit of the journey that brought us to, to today. Two years ago, we cre created a consortium to submit a proposal for the European Commission call for research new ways to support social enterprises across the European Union. And we came with the idea of creating a consortium that really represents the sector. Having DCU representing the academia and being the research lead with Dr. Derek O'Brien, who is here today, having a long history um, in the area of social enterprises from early 1990s, with Community Finance Ireland representing the supply side the social finance sector, and Rethink Island with an extensive experience providing cash grants and non-financial support to social enterprises, but also having the support of the Irish Social Enterprise Network, the largest networks for social enterprises and social entrepreneurs in Ireland. So together we brought our extensive experience to collectively support the sector. And for the ones who doesn't know too much about Rethink Island, I just want to give a snapshot about how we have been supporting the social enterprise sector. So Rethink Ireland, we bring together public and, and private funding to support social enterprises and social innovations across the country. Uh, in the last seven years, we have been able to create an 85 million fund to support social innovations with the support of the government of Ireland, especially the DRCD and the Dormans Accounts Funds, and uh, the support from philanthropy. When we talk about philanthropy, we talk about different corporates and um, foundations who has been supporting. To, we are talking about Google, we are talking about IPB, we are talking about Mason, Hayes and Karen, and many others who has been supporting us from the beginning. What we do is we provide cash grants and capacity building support to social enterprises and social innovations. But when we talk about social enterprise, in the last seven years, we have been able to invest almost 12 million euros in the sector 
supporting 145 social enterprises. And when we talk about 145 social enterprises at all levels, from early stages, from idea stage to consolidation, we have been supporting social enterprises across the whole country and with different type of communities. Um, for us, something that is extremely important is the non-financial supports. The non-financial supports that supports the grow and maximize the impact and the organizational resilience of these organizations. And when we talk about Community Finance Island uh, and the support that they have been providing to the social enterprise sector, just to give you a snapshot, social Community Finance Island is a social finance provider with all island remit who has been able to invest 40, 94 millions, and today they have 34 millions under management, providing more than 1,000 social loans since 2001. When we talk about loans, loans that range from 30,000 euros up to 500,000 euros, with terms lows from 15 years, as also for short terms, bridging loans with no arrangement fees. When we talk about this European project, the EASY project that started two years ago, we defined four key outputs. To do our research for the gaps and needs in the social finance sector. Second, assess the different social finance instruments and mechanisms that are across Europe and identify a suitable one to the needs here in Ireland. Design an investment readiness program for social enterprises. And finally, to pilot these social finance instruments we aim to contribute to the development of the social finance sector in Ireland, supporting social enterprises to scale and to maximize their social impact. And now I will be giving pass to Donald Trainer to explain you more about the product. Thank you. Thanks, Mario, um, for, the, for the brief introduction. It was great. Uh, good, uh, good morning, friends. It's great to see you all here again. Um, and, and lots of, of other faces that I'll make friends with later on today, no doubt. Uh, back about 2018, I think it was, uh, Deirdre Martell, CEO of Rethink Ireland, uh, was at an award ceremony here in Dublin City, and she, she put down a challenge to the social finance ecosystem in the country that she felt that the, the current uh, financial instruments that were in play were not uh, compatible with the needs and requirements of all the social enterprise space. And when the minister was up here speaking earlier on, I thought of two things. Number one, she's very like Santa Claus this moment in time in the amount of money she's dishing out to the space. Um, but number two, she mentioned about the need to be you know, inclusive, innovative, uh, practical and effective. And I believe that what we're here to speak about today is, is very much along those lines. So in terms of, of, of what, like we went out, Community Finance Ireland are a member of FABIA. It's a pan-European network of alternative banks and ethical investors. Um, it gave us access to an awful lot of, of colleagues uh, uh, speaking time out abroad in terms of the types of financial instruments that are in play in Europe and currently not here in Ireland. So we wanted to go out and see, well, what might we be able to bring back in here to be effective for the social enterprise space? And there are lots of things. Um, I think there were 17 different instruments in total that currently aren't in play here in Ireland. Not all of them would be readily replicable here in this country. So we needed to kind of tame down our expectations. We brought it down to a shortlist of about three. Um, we went out to the marketplace and asked social enterprise on the ground, you know, if these sort of things are made available, would you be interested in them? We went to the capital providers and said, you know, if we put these tools in place, would you be in a position to kind of roll them out? Uh, and so that was through different things like surveys, which we had good response to, uh, workshops online. Uh, myself and, and Mario went out, with, and Margaret Leahy went around the country and did a number of um, face-to-face -face workshops recently as well, just to test the market. And, and the, the feedback has been very positive. We learned a lot of very important things. Number one, when we talk about social finance in this country, um, at least 50% of the marketplace think we're talking about grants. Um, also, in fairness, uh, I think, you know, in terms of social enterprise space, when we talk about loan finance requirements, uh, at least 50% of the market is actually still getting loan finance from the banking system directly. So that was, I suppose, interesting as well. And then we, we looked about the, the, the short list of stuff and, and the, the feedback that we got is that some of the products we were talking about was too complex and we have to keep it simple, okay? Because we still, we've, we've made an awful lot of progression over the last three years, but we still need to keep things simple. And um, there's none of us, well, very few of us 
uh, chartered accountants, uh, including myself, so we need, to, we need to kind of keep it in layman's terms. So we looked inwards in terms of what we have at our disposal and where, and I don't use the word expertise now uh, too often, but what we're, what we're good at. Uh, and we looked at some of the partners in the consortium, and Rethink Ireland have, as Mario has pointed out, a strong history of putting successful grant supports on the ground for the social enterprise space, especially those at early stage level. And when Deirdre Mortel was speaking in 2018, that's the group she was talking about those early stage organisations that were transitioning through that valley of debt at the start um, with very little or, or, or no support, or not knowing where to look for the support. So we decided we were going to come up with a, uh, a blended social finance model, which we're going to call hybrid social finance from this point forward. And it's taken, it's taken the best things of those things, those tools that are at our disposal from Rethink and from Community Finance Ireland. And I should point out that this is not unique to Community Finance Ireland and Rethink Ireland. It's a tool that can be used by anybody. We don't have a patent on this. But we do have access to the resources and cash that we need to get it off the ground in a pilot, in a pilot manner. So this is what we're talking about. Uh, hybrid social finance will consist of a repayable loan with interest, a non-repayable loan, as opposed to anybody thinking it was a grant, and finally then, non-financial business supports. And we believe this last bit, this last bit is extremely, extremely important. Uh, I won't go into the history of Community Finance Ireland, but certainly this approach in terms of two separate partners Providing two different aspects to the product is very, very important, and the importance hasn't been lost on Community Finance Ireland. The result of this product then will be to increase the sustainability of startup social enterprise in Ireland. At the moment, grants are the main source of financial support for startup social enterprise, and that's great. There's always going to be a place for grants, particularly at that startup phase. But with grants, there are strings attached. You have to fit certain boxes. It's always great to hear of new grant supports, but if they don't just exactly match what it is that you're trying to do, there's that potential that you might have to move out of your comfort zone into somewhere that you didn't want to travel before. So we're keen that we retain autonomy within our social enterprises. So we're looking to target this to startups with little or no trading record, although beyond concept point, um, and they're looking to trial a new product or service. So they may have been perhaps on the go for a period of time, but the trial and new product or service, we'll also look at that. Um, as long as they have a minimal amount of trustees, that they have the power to borrow, and that's very important, I would suggest that everybody in terms of the legal formats go back and make sure that you have that authority to borrow. They may be coming to the table with very little by way of collateral, in fact, no collateral whatsoever. And so all this lending will be done on an unsecured basis. Don't expect them to have a, a great amount of equity participation uh, coming to the table, sometimes in our community finance area loans, we look maybe from anywhere between 5 and 20% of, of, of match funding. Um, but generally speaking, we don't expect that to be uh, really at play in this, in this particular instance. Um, we expect them to be unattractive to mainstream traditional finance, and in fact, we expect them to be unattractive to mainstream social finance as well. If an organisation is coming to Community Finance Ireland through this product, and they have the repayment capacity for the entirety of what it is they're looking for, well then, this isn't what, what it's for. This is, we are going to prioritise for those that really need this type of support in the early stages. We want to ensure that the social enterprise we're dealing with have a commercial focus, as opposed to exclusively looking to fundraising as a form of sustainability in the future. So we need to be looking at you to, to, to start trading services or products, and primarily first-time borrowing entities. In fact, I would say that this is going to be one hit for an organisation. The whole purpose of this is to wean you off that grant dependency, just to move you into that autonomy, debt sustainability uh, area down the line. So our objective as Community Finance Ireland in this product is to provide lending without the need for guarantees from you, while minimising the potential for default across the portfolio. So since 2007, if we just take the Republic of Ireland, our business has put €40 million Euro on the ground, and we've lost €47,000 of that. So that's something that we want to maintain. So we're innovative, we're pioneering, we want to push the boundaries in terms of what we can. We have great support through the Social Finance Foundation, through the Easy Credit Guarantee Scheme from the European Investment Fund, but we're seen as a safe pair of hands. We don't want to lose that reputation. So we need to balance our risk here and what we're doing. And we also want to encourage the social enterprise to develop a credit record. That's very important for us because it means that after this, you can go to a social finance provider, a credit union, a bank, whatever it might be, and you can say, I have experience of handling debt successfully in the past. And that's very important for us. The due diligence that we uh, should at least determine the following criteria that you're creating social impact and that this investment will go some way to enhance sustaining that level of social impact into the future. That you have a business case for success and that all-important repayment capacity. And that the areas to strengthen organisational capacities in order to improve investment readiness. So this is an example of what we're talking about. 
I suppose we're going to run this pilot in 2023. We'll have two calls, the start of the year and in the middle of the year. We expect that we'll learn lots from the first call uh, and build it into the second call. Um, but essentially an organisation, uh, and I use um, perhaps we're trying to, to, to target often social enterprise from what we might refer to some more marginalised aspect of the sector. So if we look at maybe those coming out of, of, of the criminal justice system, uh, recovery and drug addicts, uh, the travelling community, migrant community, female-led, uh, youth-led, disabled-led, but we're, we're primarily targeting those organisations, we won't turn away anybody. So the organisation would probably come and say, look at Donald, we've got a project here, we need a 50,000 euro support in terms of loan finance. And when we run the figures on it, it transpires that they don't have the repayment capacity for 50,000. But they do have the repayment capacity for 25 of it. And so long as they have the social enterprise status and that they have that minimal social impact from the trading uh, perspective, we're saying, OK, well, let's, let's introduce Rethink to this situation. And we work together then for hybrid social finance to take place. And what it means then, Rethink Ireland will come in, if it, if it passes muster with us, Rethink Ireland will come in with a €25,000 non-repayable loan. And that, that, that facility will remain non-repayable based on a couple of simple conditions. They will also receive, regardless of the amount of the loan, they're requiring non-financial support to the value of €10,000. This non-financial support will focus on improving the investment readiness of the selected organisations. It will take place very much over the first year of the investment. Uh, and Rethink will also give the, uh, the investee uh, a place in their accelerator programme. For our part, Community Finance Ireland will buy the other 50% of the funding in the form of a repayable loan with interest. Of course, it will be unsecured, and I mentioned earlier on that we'll be accessing the easy credit guarantee um, to, to enable that. And that's the whole purpose behind that credit guarantee. That's what the EIF set it up. It in trying to encourage social lenders to take that extra risk on new social enterprise, and that's what we feel we're doing here. I refer to this as kind of a kindergarten loan. It's like a loan with stabilizers on it. For everybody concerned, we want to make sure that we're doing everything in a very responsible manner. The net result here is that the social enterprise, in this actual example, gets €50,000 in funding, 50% 50 of it non-repayable, the other repayable with interest, and the non-financial support assumed at a value of 10000 means the total supports, in this case, €60,000. But they only have to repay a total, and this is based on today's interest rate of 6.25%. They only repay a total of €29,000, including interest over five years. And five years is the maximum term of the loan. We want to get this money back in quick. We don't want to be looking at first-time first borrowers in the social enterprise sector taking on long-term debt. There will be no penalties for early redemption. I didn't. I normally do mention the fact that I'm a Cavan man, so if I do get the money back ahead of schedule, everybody's a winner. Okay? So therefore, the, cost, the blended cost of this support, in this case, you see, is 3.2%. Uh, and, and even the fact that interest rates probably will increase uh, come January and when we, when we launch this call, you can see that for €60,000, you're repaying uh, a, a portion of it, the interest rate, the blended rate uh, mitigates the, 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 uh, the effect of the increased interest rate environment that we're experiencing at the moment. And that is that. I'm hoping that I, oh, I didn't go too over, uh, but, but just to thank the guys in the department for their support. And, and it would be wrong of me not to mention, you know, we have, I think earmarked is probably the best word. We've earmarked some support from the department uh, with, with the whole economic environment the way it is. We're not sure, but we're expecting that that will be there in 2023. So I just want to thank the guys for their ears and minds and focus on an invitation here today. Thank you. Um, thank you, Donal and Mario. Uh, what a very welcome product to the social enterprise market. Um, there was words that I wrote down there that I know from having worked on different funding streams, and in particular the Kickstart uh, scheme with Pubble. You know that n those non-financial business supports are absolutely worth their weight in gold. Um, the piece there around not needing to have that traded income track record uh, often blocks social enterprises. Today is about new beginnings. And I, I think it's very apt that that new social finance fund is being launched today. Um, very interesting. I'm sure you probably have lots of questions uh, coming up to Christmas and people with ideas wanting to set up social enterprises. But anything that is there to increase the sustainability of, and st of starting social enterprises is to be welcomed. However, now we're coming to a most important part. Um, it's coffee. <laughs> Can I just say, we've run ever so slightly over. Um, I'm, I'm going to call you back. Uh, if we could make it 15 minutes, so you've got a lot of networking to do. Maggie, stay where you are. Don't stand up just yet. Can I, can I, can I, just, can I just say, during the break, 
There will be some videos that are being shown on the screens that, are, that, were, that were created as a result of the Arise funding, so do just keep an eye out for that. Network, 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 caffeine, go enjoy. See you, see you in 15 minutes. Kick off with the next session. I hope you all enjoyed the networking opportunity over coffee and this morning's uh, speakers, which I think were, were very, very interesting. Now it's time for us to move into the next part of the day. As you know, the last 12 months have been extremely active on the European Union level in relation to social economy and social enterprise. So it's a pleasure for me now to introduce Ms. Birgit Falahi Bronyo, who is the Head of Unit for Social and Inclusive Entrepreneurship at the European Commission, who will give us an update on the action plan, the social economy, and indeed on the work towards the transition pathway. So, Brigitte, thank you so much for being with us, and the floor is yours. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, the invitation. Uh, unfortunately, I would like to say that uh, my commissioner, uh, Mr. Schmidt, you know, is very, very keen on social enterprises, but could not join you today because he had prior commitments. So, but I'm very happy to, to be able to replace him and be with you today. Uh, this year's conference is particularly rich. I mean, I, I saw you, uh, the videos while you were on the break, so very nice uh, 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 enterprises already. Uh, and beyond that, so I understand you are working on renewing your uh, social enterprise policy in Ireland and uh, on an international level. I guess you are aware we also have quite a number of initiatives and a lot of momentum at the, at the, at the moment uh, with work going on, obviously, in the European Commission, uh, but also with ILO, who is preparing a resolution. The OECD is also has been working on recommendations, and at the UN, even we have a, a resolution which is ongoing. So a lot of activity, a lot of interest, a lot of momentum that I think we should all take advantage of, uh, considering the potential of this sector. Uh, what is key, I mean, for social economy, obviously, is that we work together so that we can share experiences, reinforce efforts, and uh, that's really the key to build uh, coherent and strong policies. So uh, now I've been asked to update you a bit more on what happens at the EU level in terms of policies and initiatives. And I'd like to give you a first, I mean, kind of a really overview of the main things. As you are probably aware, uh, last December 2021, the European Commission adopted an action plan with a vision for how the European Union should support the social economy, including social enterprises, until 2030. So it really gives us a, a vision and a roadmap until 2030. And the key, obviously, is that uh, we should work with all relevant stakeholders. So we'll come back to it at the end. The action plan concretely includes about 60 initiatives uh, covering all aspects of the ecosystem, the legal framework, access to funding, business support, social innovation, and uh, we have uh, over 25 directorates general of the European Commission involved in the implementation, so it's really a comprehensive exercise. And now we are moved to the delivery stage, which uh, is obviously the, the key one. Uh, it's good to have the action plan, but really you know, what will make a difference is the implementation. And there, uh, I would like to give you a few examples. Uh, first, um, we, have, we are preparing a council recommendation to develop social economy framework conditions. So the, uh, the objective is to give more prominence to social economy in all member states, because you know, today the uh, development of social enterprises and social economy is quite uneven across member states. And we want to encourage them all to adopt an overall and coherent strategy to support the uh, alternative business model. And this is something brand new, and we are already working on it in cooperation with member states, but also all stakeholders, uh, civil society organizations, social partners, to make sure that we can devise a useful uh, recommendation for all member states. It will have three main dimensions. Uh, the idea is to invite member states to and other competent public authorities to adapt their policy and legal framework, but also their administrative and institutional structures if need be, to better support the social economy entities. And finally, encourage competent public authorities at all levels, not just national, but also regional, local, to engage with social economy stakeholders. Um, 
In parallel to this uh, preparation and the uh, consultation work that is ongoing, we also plan and have an answer it that we will launch seminars, webinars, workshops with public officials in the member states to help them get more familiar with a number of topics which are important for uh, the development of social economy. And uh, of course, I mean, we, we expect that uh, we will publicize it and we expect that uh, Irish public officials will take part in due course uh, as soon as we have the, these workshops set up. Another important activity, which I think will be, uh, is expected by many of you actually, is the social economy gateway, which we announce also in the action plan. The idea is to have a single entry point uh, on the internet uh, where you could find uh, information on all related um, funding uh, options, policies, initiatives in relation to uh, social economy. So we know there is a lot of expect there are a lot of expectations in that respect that the getting information is seen as crucial and often difficult. So we hope that when we launch this um, gateway, which is expected in the spring next year, uh, that will make your life much easier. But there again, I mean, we, we are also consulting stakeholders and uh, all input feedback will be very useful for us to make sure that this gateway is useful for you. Then, uh, well, just uh, three days ago, uh, we launched the transition pathway for uh, the uh, green and digital transition of the social economy ecosystem. Uh, you might know that uh, as part of the new EU uh, industrial strategy, we have defined 14 ecosystems and social economy is one of these 14 key ecosystems for the EU. Uh, and the idea was to devise together with the uh, all stakeholders again, a pathway to make sure that uh, they could, these systems can make the best of the green and digital transitions. For uh, social economy, the outcome so was just presented uh, for the official launch on Monday evening, and uh, 14 areas have been identified for action to support uh, social economy actors. Um, so now, I mean, the, they are linked to um, both the green and the digital transitions with a number of activities foreseen, notably in respect of skills, but also this business support, how to work on the value chains. I mean, uh, quite a number of areas that have been identified together with all of you. And now, I mean, we also rely on all of you to implement this pathway to make sure it happens. And the idea uh, is that um, stakeholders have been already asked to make pledges, commitments, but how has an entity as a, firm, as a social ent enterprise, they will contribute uh, to make this, uh, this transition work and uh, really make concrete uh, pledges about how many staff they want to reskill or reach out or organize seminars, whatever. So there we obviously encourage you as well to take part in this uh, movement and, uh, and make pledges so that social economy can succeed in the twin transitions. Um, another dimension, another collaborative effort is the Pact for Skills. Where in May this year, as well, so as you see, uh, many initiatives going on, uh, a new partnership was adopted for uh, the social economy ecosystem as well. And there also the idea, I mean, as a basis of the declaration uh, that all participants agreed and the objective is to improve the skills and the quality jobs around key professional competencies, which are linked to digital, Social, social entrepreneurship and capacity building. 191 stakeholders across Europe have already joined the PAC, PACT, sorry, uh, and uh, with the objective really to help with upskilling and reskilling uh, their workforce. So all social economy actors, again, are encouraged to join this pact for skills and make the best use. Um, it comes with a number of uh, hubs that support uh, the actors with uh, networking, knowledge, guidance, and other resources which are made uh, jointly available. Uh, moving to business support and access to markets, and also a number of initiatives going on. One of them is a better incubation project. Uh, which was funded by the European Commission under the previous e EASY program so for employment and social innovation. And uh, it's implemented by the European Bus Business Network and it will come to a close this December. And one of the main uh, major deliverables is that they will come with concrete recommendations for both policymakers and business support organizations about how to help 
uh, also uh, develop uh, social enterprises. Um, a lot of activities, I mean, uh, I, I don't want to, 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 to lose you with all of them. Uh, another important angle, obviously, is uh, public procurement for uh, public authorities and having social responsible public procurement. We see initiatives there and there of uh, making sure that uh, social enterprises have access to public procurement. And uh, obviously, what we need to do there is reinforce um, raise awareness so that people are aware of what is possible in that field. Um, finally, another initiative I would have I wanted to flag as well is the new European Competence Centre for Social Innovation. Obviously, there are many links between social enterprises and social innovation. So we have we are just finalizing the setup of this uh, European Competence Centre, and the idea will be to really be able to share best practices experiences across member states uh, through community of practices, but also through calls for proposals. Uh, this is under the European Social Fund Plus, um, and to have also the opportunity to have some uh, bottom-up calls launched between countries to support uh, these activities. So uh, to put it in a nutshell, I mean, as you could see from my intervention, a lot of momentum, a lot of activities, we have now the social economy action plan. We have all the actions we want to implement. For that, we need you. We need your contribution. We need your cooperation. So please engage with us. Um, and uh, I, uh, we also very much look forward to seeing your new policy uh, in Ireland, which we are devising. And I just have, I guess, to wish you a very fruitful discussion this afternoon. I, I saw there was a lot of uh, dynamic changes. So pretty sure you will have very good discussions. Thanks again for inviting me. Brigitte, uh, sincere thanks to you for your time and for that overview. It feels like um, all of the stars are aligning internationally when we see the, 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 the very strong and committed leadership of Commissioner Schmidt at the European Union level, the, the developments at the OECD level, the ILO, and increasingly the UN. Um, it's very important for us in the national uh, situations to have that sort of alignment uh, of thinking and that momentum internationally. So again, sincere thanks to you and our greetings to Commissioner Schmidt. Uh, thank you very much. You're uh, welcome. Bye. Have a nice meeting. Thank, thank you. That leads me uh, directly on and with one eye on the clock to the next uh, segment of, of our programme this, the, today. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased now to introduce uh, Emma Murta from The Wheel, who is going to uh, present to you some of the very important work that is uh, taking place under the Access Europe programme, which is a programme supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. And really, it's, it's going back to what Brigitte was mentioning around narrowing that gap between uh, the supports that are available uh, at an EU level and th those, those supports being accessed by you on the ground here in Ireland. So Emma, thank you very much. Great. Thanks. While Andrew is getting me a clicker, I'll just get started. Um, so hi, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. As Andrew said, my name is Emma Mertza. I'm the European Programmes Manager at The Wheel. Um, thank you very much. And The Wheel, for those of you who don't know, although probably most people here do, uh, we are the National Association for Charities, Community and Voluntary Organisations and Social Enterprises. So I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to present to all of you at this conference in person, which is very exciting, um, uh, and to share some of the updates of what we are doing in the social enterprise space. So just in terms of a very short agenda, because it's a, it's a short slot, I have two real goals in this session. The first is to update you about our new social enterprise supports and projects that are now available at the wheel that we hope will be of interest to the people here in this room um, and, and which are brought to you largely thanks to European funding. Um, and then also to share some information how you too can also develop uh, your uh, new initiatives or, or new initiatives and scale up your organisation using EU funding in the same way that we have. So um, I want to start by just giving a brief background as to how we got to this point in our development of our social enterprise work. 
Um, the first thing to note, I suppose, is that the wheel has, has long held an ambition to consolidate our existing supports that are available to social enterprises um, and to further increase the, our, our capacity and, and our resources that are available uh, to social enterprises, as, as given that it's such an, a growing and important aspect of the overall sector. Uh, however, as a, a social enterprise and a charity ourselves, of course, the issue is always funding and capacity. And how, how do we do this? How do we meet this challenge? And how do we access the funding and, and, and get the capacity we need to deliver on it? So it was actually our chairperson at the time, Paula Sullivan, who's here today, who, who was uh, uh, the CEO of Clan Credo at the time as well. Um, so he was the one that alerted us to all of the major developments that were happening in this space, in the overall social economy space in Europe, which we heard a lot about so far today. Um, and so suggested that European programmes could be our, our pathway to developing these services and delivering on this ambition. So uh, we started to really focus on European projects and get really actively involved in European networks. Um, and since then, just a number of opportunities have followed. So through the first thing we did, I suppose, was, was and what I always recommend as somebody who's mentoring people about European funding every day of the week, is to get involved with the networks at European level. So we joined uh, Social Economy Europe, which is the largest um, network, EU-wide network for uh, social economy organisations and representative bodies. Um, and through them, we were able to take a really active role in shaping the social economy action plan, which Brigitte talked about there. Um, and this was published late last year. And, and part of that, part of our role in helping to shape that through Social Economy Europe was to ensure that the term charity was included in the overall definition, which you can see there. Um, this is a, a term that isn't so widely used in Europe. They're more inclined to say things like NGO or association. But we all know that the overlap between charities and social enterprises is significant and that charities are an important aspect of the, social, of the overall social economy here in Ireland. And so we felt that it was very important that that was represented. Um, through this participation and active role in helping to shape this action plan, and I should say also signing the Pact of for Skills that was also mentioned earlier, um, we, were able, we were invited to um, participate in the launch of the action plan. It was a delayed launch due to the blip that we've, we've mentioned already, um, which uh, took place in May. So you can see our CEO, Deirdre Garvey, who's also here somewhere, uh, and the, on the panel with Commissioner Schmidt, who's been such a huge supporter of the action plan and of the overall social economy, um, on the panel in, in Strasbourg launching this, this document. Um, and it's a bit small, but you can see one of our first promises that we made in, in Strasbourg was to deliver our own uh, kind of strategy that would interpret um, and contextualise the recommendations of the SEEP, the Social Economy Action Plan, in the Irish context. Um, and that's exactly what we did. In September of this year, um, we launched, along with uh, Minister Humphreys, our platform for progress in response to the SEEP um, and presenting our, our vision for the future. Um, so these are, I suppose, a number of the the practice or the the policy breakthroughs that we've had thanks to stepping up our, our work at that European level and taking that initiative. Um, but we've also had uh, a number of kind of funding successes and project successes that have allowed us or are allowing us to scale up our practical supports uh, for the, the social enterprises and the overall social economy in Ireland. Um, so one of our big wins, obviously everybody in this room that's in a social enterprise, you know, capacity is always the issue. So one of our big wins is increased capacity. So somewhere here is my, oh there you go, uh, <laughs> somewhere there is my colleague Sean Darcy, who just started with us in May and uh, he's our new social enterprise officer. <laughs> oh look, <laughs> great. Uh, so... <laughs> He has a number of responsibilities. Hopefully this isn't news to him now. Uh, but um, this includes uh, operating a help desk, advice and support service for social enterprises, um, as well as relaunching our social enterprise network, which actually took place, the first meeting of that took place yesterday and was a great success. Um, he's also going to be issuing regular newsletters and other updates to keep people informed about funding and policy and other relevant uh, updates in the area, perhaps an events calendar. I know that was uh, <laughs> thrown around earlier or any other ideas that people have that of, of useful resources that, uh, that the sector could use. Um, he's also maintaining our new social enterprise hub, which is on wheel.ie forward slash social enterprise, so very much kind of watch this space. There'll be lots happening on there soon. 
um, and then also supporting the, the delivery of our social enterprise projects very importantly. So the first of those projects that I want to mention is Revitalize EU. Uh, so this is about revitalizing European social economy organizations. So this is a, a major Erasmus Plus funded project. It's led by The Wheel with partners from six different EU countries. Actually, one of the partners was is uh, partnered with the, the CORA, the Social Innovation Hub. There's a, it's a very small sector in Europe, so there's a lot of overlap there. Um, but the goal of this, uh, it was actually based on a national pilot, which some of you might have participated in, uh, that was extremely successful, and we decided to scale up to EU level. But the goal of it is to provide innovative training and networking opportunity to long-established social economy organisations. So we define this as seven years plus. We just found that a lot of the supports that were available for social enterprises kind of focus on the innovation or the startup phase and, and we wanted to build something for the many social enterprises who have been exist in existence for many years because even if we didn't call it social enterprise, you know, social enterprise as a, as a verb has existed in Ireland for a very long time. So it's about bringing those people together and, and, and connecting them with where they are in their journey and providing them with lots of free training and networking opportunities. Uh, and this will be taking place throughout Europe and we'll bring them together so they'll be able to network at, at national and at European level. So um, in doing this, we hope to increase the overall visibility of the European social economy. Um, and for this project, it kicked off earlier this year. So uh, we're in the development phase at the moment, but stay tuned for that one. And there'll be lots of free training and opportunities later on this, or next year, I should say. Uh, the next project I want to uh, mention is our, our largest project. It's the BASE project. Um, so this actually refers to what Bridget mentioned as well around the industrial ecosystems and how Europe has recognized the social economy as one of its 14 key industrial ecosystems. So this project is the project, the single project that the European Commission is funding for that ecosystem, for the social economy ecosystem, um, to create a European blueprint or framework to address uh, skills needs in the social economy. So uh, this is a really exciting project. It's, uh, it's huge. It just kicked off last month, so very early days yet but it's uh, 25 partners from 10 different countries. It's going to be going on over four years. Um, and we, The Wheel is the only Irish partner in it, given we were invited in, given our, our long track record of over 20 years of, of training uh, social economy organizations and being a co-signatory of the Pact for Skills. Um, and there'll be lots of uh, research that we'll be publishing and training opportunities coming over the next couple of years with that one. So a final one that has come up a couple of times already is uh, the Employment and Social Innovation Fund. So an, an interesting development from the, the new set of programmes in 2021 is that there's now going to be a national contact point for the EASY programme. Um, and the wheel was appointed as the national contact point to promote calls and to support applications. Uh, and that's what happened over the summer. So um, this is the first time that there's been a national contact point for the employment and social innovation programme. So it's very exciting. So this programme, we heard some interesting examples of it already today but it funds projects that promote a high level of quality and sustainable employment, improve working conditions, support adequate social protection, and combat social exclusion and poverty. So it's an extremely relevant one for many of the people in this room. There's only been one call so far, and it was before we were appointed, but we can expect that there'll be many calls coming from, from next year onwards, uh, and we'll be hoping to actually do an Irish launch very soon as well. So uh, basically another kind of watch this space moment, but there'll certainly be lots of funding deadlines and lots of tailored support from the wheel to access that funding. So on the topic of European funding, which is obviously the bit that I'm the most interested in. So, um, you know, I've shared a lot so far about how the wheel, you know, had this ambition around scaling up our social enterprise supports. And uh, through European funding, we, we were able to leverage that uh, in order to be able to, to, to deliver on that ambition. So um, we run a program, if I can get the slide back up, if at all possible, thank you. Uh, so uh, we run a program called Access Europe where our goal is to help others do exactly that same thing. So to, to help to scale up their organizations using, using European funding. So Andrew mentioned it already, but it's Access Europe, uh, and many of you hopefully would have heard of it before, but it's an EU funding support service for Irish civil society. So it's um, funded by the Department of Foreign Foreign Affairs and it's designed to be a one-stop shop for all of your EU funding needs and this includes 
updates on new EU funding programmes and deadlines. So we research on behalf of the sector and publish uh, those updates on our, on our website and via a monthly newsletter, which is free. Uh, we also offer a number of free trainings and events on all aspects of accessing and managing European funding. We can provide one-to-one -one advice, application support, and signposting to, to experts and to other national contact points. And then we provide uh, networking opportunities locally and at EU level. So as many of you know, partnership is a, a key part of, of a lot of European funding. So uh, one of the things, we do a number of things in this area, but one thing is our, our database, our online database, where Irish organisations can upload their profile um, and make Europe aware that they, are, that they are open to European funding, which we can then kind of disseminate and promote throughout Europe. So this is a free programme, um, and it's open to all of civil society, including social enterprises. So, you know, if there's so many opportunities beyond the easy programme which came, came up today. There's so many opportunities for social enterprises, no matter what your area of work is. So um, I'd really encourage you to reach out to us, and we're very happy to, to provide any support that we can, and our contact details are there. Um, just, to, just to kind of finish up, um, you can connect with The Wheel for information on anything that I spoke about today and follow along with our own social enterprise journey as it continues and indeed start your own EU funding journey, hopefully. Uh, but that's it from me. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Emma. And I am... Um, uh, sincere thanks for that update on, on all of the brilliant work that The Wheel is doing. And just to say we're blessed in this country with having a range of networks, SERI, ISCN, Social Impact Ireland, ILDN, many, many others that are doing brilliant work to uh, support social enterprises in all sorts of ways. Um, uh, given that, just one little digression if you don't mind, given that today is all about new beginnings, it would be remiss of me not to congratulate Deirdre Garvey um, on her own The New Beginning, uh, uh, who she has played a fantastically positive role for this sector over many, many years. And we, we wish you the very, very best, Deirdre, with your own New Beginning. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to give the floor now to Siobhan Cafferty to introduce our panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Sorry. Um, this is the piece I've been waiting on. Yeah. To be honest with you, I think you know this has been an amazing morning. I'm sure your minds are blown the way mine is. Lots of information. But let's not forget that social enterprises, while our businesses, they're about people. They're about people, the people that run them, the people that drive out the social mission, the social change, but also then the people that they employ, work with, train, the local communities. So I have immense pleasure in inviting the panelists to the stage, and I will then introduce them one by one. Oh, geez, you all look so different when we're up here. Like <laughs> yeah, this is a bit of a nerve-wracking place, you know, to be. So just to, I think, to let, let us settle in, let us do what we can to, to be in the moment. I had the privilege of meeting these four incredible people earlier this week. Um, purely so I wasn't starstruck when I got up here. Uh, what they're doing is absolutely phenomenal, and I think that this section is going to be just brilliant. Uh, so let me, let me start with this. I mean, all of you, there's increasing levels of incredibleness around, around this panel. Eileen McHugh of Hair Together, here to my left. I think, unless I'm absolutely I'm incorrect, but I think we've got Livy Curran in, in the centre, who's come the furthest. She's come from uh, County Donegal to be here with us today. So, Livy. Um, and Livy is supported. I don't know whether you pulled the shortest straw or what happened, but li li um, Livy is supported by Millie McCourt and Lucy Van Ruben. In who I suppose are their fellow entrepreneurs for the social enterprise that they set up. So you're also very welcome. <laughs> Next up is Mamobo Ogoro. I hope I got that right from Gurum Media. And can I just congratulate you on your most recent award? Uh, Mamobo won the Irish Tatler Award uh, for the Catalyst, Catalyst Award just last Saturday. So fresh from an event like this. 
And finally, down there, down the very end down there, Alwyn Patterson, who is, is from Give Dish and has very kindly just come from somewhere else to be here, to be up on stage, to talk to us all today. So, Alwyn, you're very welcome. <laughs> Just, I just want to say as well, we, I kind of want to be to having a bit of a chat with these guys up here. You will have the opportunity to ask questions, so please do, you know, jot something down if something crops into your mind. The theme of today is about new beginnings. Um, everyone up here is, it's their first time to a social enterprise conference. They're still here, they haven't run out the door, so we're doing something right. Hopefully we're not that much of a scary bunch. But I want to kind of just start an easy, easy in. Tell me a little bit about yourself, first of all, and your social enterprise. Eileen, you can start. Thank you. I don't know whether I got the short straw here, but <laughs> my heart is pounding. I'm not great at public speaking, but I'll, I'll try my best. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting us. Um, so my name is Eileen, and I'm founder of Hair Together. Um, and Hair Together is a social enterprise, and we're based in the social innovation hub there in Ballymun. Um, and what we do, we teach hairdressing and barbering skills to uh, vulnerable people and young people um, and we have a kind of wraparound wellness program that goes with that. Um, so the three of us started it, it's myself, I'm the hairdresser, Gemma's in the audience there, she's my sister and the psychotherapist and Tony, he's the barber. And what the three of us have in common is that we're all recovered from addiction, um, drug and alcohol addiction. I'm 14 years now in recovery. Tony was the year before me and Gemma was the year after. So it's a lovely story. Yeah. You'll have me crying now. <laughs> It's an amazing story. We all helped each other, so basically here together is us giving back. Um, so yeah, we're, it, position, it positions us really strongly to help the people that we do. Um, the program, it runs for 10 weeks with 10 participants. And like that, three elements, the hairdressing, the barbering, and we weave through different wellness practices and teach them life skills. It finishes on a high with a catwalk style fashion show where they get to mingle with other creatives too. So student event managers and um, videographers so it opens other kind of career opportunity exposes them to new different industries too so and um, that's a big part of it and i forgot to mention we're a multi-award winning social enterprise we uh, won <laughs> i always forget that <laughs> eileen how did you forget that i piece? always huh? do i swear to god so we won this social uh, Entrepreneurs Ireland Impact Award and a global award in the hair industry, the Kevin Murphy Icon Award for stylists and colorists that um, make a difference in, in the world around us. So we won that. That was amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and like that, at this stage, we're having a real impact on the people that we we serve, and um, we're ready to scale. We we're really in a strong position now. We have volunteer hairdressers, barbers and um, mental health professionals ready to rock. Um, we've loads of participants waiting to do our programme. And um, yeah, the sky's the limit. So that's us. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you. I, I love that Eileen forgot that, you know, the multi-award winning piece. It's like forgetting your surname, you know. But Eileen, thank you for that and for, for sharing your story. Now, Livy, over to you, your moment. Hi, I'm Livy Curran and I go to Mora College, Milford in Donegal, and I am a part of the company LNM Books. My peers, Millie McCart and Lucy Van Riven, are here today in the audience, and we are all age 17. We got involved in our social enterprise in our school through the amazing partnership with Frygan, the Department of Rural and Commun Community Development. And through this, we worked on our own social enterprise, LNM Books. LNM Books is an inclusive interactive book for children between the ages of 6 and 12. This book is creatively designed to help children understand hidden disabilities. Our book is all about different hidden disabilities and how neurodivergent people act and cope in society and everyday life. One activity asks children what, uh, to draw what they think each hidden disability looks like so that they can express, express very different views of the world. We think that if we had a product like ours on the market when we were younger, that it would have made us feel less alone. Children who do not suffer from any hidden disabilities can learn and feel empathy for children who do by reading our book. We were crowned this year's National Social Enterprise winners with Nifty, and when we found out, we were so shocked and delighted. 
The highlight has been the feeling of accomplishment with becoming young social entrepreneurs. Other highlights include being invited to this event and also planning for a trip to the European Youth Star Awards in Vienna in September next year. <laughs> Our future plans are firstly to get our book published and to expand our franchise. Thank you for listening to our journey. Yeah. I, I told you, like, it's just absolutely phenomenal. When I was 17, I don't know what I was doing, but I definitely wasn't doing anything like that. What a fantastic story. And Livia and Millie and Lucy, I'm so delighted that you're here and your family members and your support team from, from Faroga. It's an amazing thing to do. Um, and as you said, national award winners. Uh, so a trip to Dublin is nothing compa in comparison to a trip to Vienna, where you're supporting and representing us all. So well done on that. Thank you very much. Now, <laughs> moving on to Momobo, who's going to speak about Guru Media. So hi, everyone. My name is Momobo. I'm the founder of Guru Media, and we are an intercultural media and communications company on a mission to unify across cultural, social, and political differences in order to advance belonging for marginalized communities. So I started Girl Media as like um, procrastination <laughs> out of my PhD because I was kind of noticing some things that are going on. So personally, I'm a second generation migrant, I'm Nigerian, and I moved to Ireland, I moved to a really small town in Wexford. And from there, um, I had some personal experiences that kind of very prejudice, racism, and I kind of grew curious as to like why people hate. So I decided to do my undergrad, master's, and PhD in UL in the area of social psychology and applied linguistics, and I was kind of uncovering findings as to the marginalization of people in underrepresented communities in Irish media. So in the height of COVID-19, I was like, okay, I don't want to do this PhD anymore, I have to do something different. And I started a podcast called um, Gurm TV and I kind of brought friends from different cultural backgrounds in Ireland to kind of talk about the nuances, experiences and challenges that come about um, being of different backgrounds. And from there, it kind of just spiraled into a platform that highlights the voices of people in different and diverse communities. So we are on a mission, I like to say to everyone that I'm on a personal mission to unify the world. And it starts <laughs> with um, hearing people's stories. So what do we do? We actually um, have an online platform where we hear the different stories. And we work with a lot of other NGOs, charities, and social enterprises to kind of highlight the voices and the impactful work that they're doing in order to amplify um, the stories of people in underrepresented communities. But what we kind of noticed, and in order for us to be kind of sustainable as a social enterprise in terms of trading income and things like that, that wasn't earning a lot of money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was just like, okay, what, what am I going to do to actually um, have this be sustainable, not rely on um, grant income, because that was what we were relying on. So I was like, one of my mentors, she was like, okay, you have a whole PhD <laughs> and you're, you're learning um, a lot about um, how people can actually not only be aware of the diversity that we have in Ireland, um, where one in eight people of Ireland, in Ireland are from a culturally diverse or ethnically diverse background, and that's growing to a rate of 10 to 12% when we look at like little babies and things like that. But, but the, I actually have, and my team has the skills to engage across lines of differences. So I actually want to kind of ask a question. I like to do really interactive things as well. <laughs> but I want to kind of, well, I want you to raise your hand if you think, this is kind of rhetorical question, but raise your hand if you think like diversity is important. And so, but which one of us, I want to keep your hands up, keep your hands up straight. But how many of us have been actually formally trained to engage across lines of cultural and social differences? Okay, something, that's what I was a bit expecting. So what we actually do in order to, thank you so much. What we actually do in order to sustain ourselves um, as a social enterprise is we work on a top-down level to actually support and equip leaders with the skills to navigate, engage, and um, manage diverse and multicultural teams. What we notice is that a lot of organizations, they're very aware, which is great, in terms of um, diversity, in terms of the, the, the different communities that they have in their organizations, but a lot of people still don't have the behavioral, the linguistic, and the communication skills to engage across um, lines of differences. So that's where we kind of come in and we have an expert team of so, social and cultural psychologists who actually, um, and we're actually launching our program next year, but who actually equip 
um, leaders, and that actually feeds into further impact in terms of systems change, but to actually equip leaders um, to engage and unify across lines of differences. So we work on a top-down level to equip leaders, and then on a bottom level to hear and empower communities in order to tell their stories. So yeah, we're, we're, we have a very small team of, of people that work with us and volunteers as well, who are really passionate about the work that we do, and again, want to unify. We call, we call our, uni, um, our community unifiers, and we're at the stage where we're kind of looking for partners and different people to, to engage with us and help us um, unify the world as well. So thank you so much. Thank you again, like honestly didn't I tell you that this is going to be a very interesting panel discussion. Um, I think your very small team is going to be very stretched over the next while. I think you know you actually did put it out there. Let's not forget that these are social enterprises that do require support. They do require customers. They do require uh, engagement, uh, contracts. So uh, it's, Mabobo has very clearly put it out there to you all, and that's why she won the Catalyst Awards just on Saturday. Thank you. Last but by no means least. We've got Alwyn Patterson down here at the end, who's going to speak about her social enterprise called Give Dish. Hi, everyone. It's very hard to follow all those <laughs> incredible speakers, but I'm very happy to be here today. So I'm the co-founder of Give Dish. Um, we help restaurants sell higher margin products by adding a charitable incentive at purchase. So you can walk into our partners and order the Give Dish, and a meal will be donated to a child in need just by ordering that dish. So our whole kind of mission or what kind of drives us or what motivated us was how can we find a way to give back to charity or kind of generate donations without um, kind of being out of pocket. We're like, we're a team of young people and uh, from the kind of research, I suppose you'd call it, that we did, you know, people aren't donating to charities, but we wanted to see how can you do it in a kind of frictionless way, in a voting with your actions and not with your wallet directly. So um, that's what we do. We're, we're live in four restaurants across Dublin City. We're extremely uh, new to the scene. Um, so we're really proud of the progress we've made. We really only set up in um, kind of late July this year. Um, but you can walk into Bread 41, uh, Shimak, uh, Sumaki, and uh, Mad Yokes over in Smithfield. Order a give dish, and just by doing that, a meal will be donated to someone in need through our charity partner, Mary's Meals. So they operate in 20 countries around the world, providing meals to children in school. Uh, so we've started kind of on this global mission, and but we're actively engaged with our partners to donate meals to children in Ireland as well. We've actually had extremely exciting meetings about that this week, which I don't know, maybe one of the questions <laughs> relate to that, but I'm really excited about the mission that we're on and can't wait to chat about it with everyone here. So Brilliant. thank you. Thank you. Very much. Can I just ask you to repeat the four partners that you have, the, the four yes, restaurants, please? Yes, please go down and get lunch exactly. in the following. Uh, any brunch heads, Bread 41, they do a, a brunch at the weekends and everything you order there, a meal is donated, which is incredible. We're really grateful to that partner. Uh, Sumaki, uh, Sushi burritos, innovative. Um, they're down on Parliament Street, really recommend. We've got Shimak. Uh, down on Anger Street or Georgia Street, um, the most tasty croquettes you will ever eat in your entire <laughs> life. Um, and then Mad Yolks over in Smithfield, uh, also a new enough business. They've got these incredible nachos. You don't realize that nachos need an egg until you have these ones. <laughs> um, but they're absolutely delicious. So if you're looking for uh, to go out for lunch with your friends or go out for dinner and want to make an impact, then please um, check out those, those locations. Thank you. Brilliant. Oh, well, thank you. And I think... Um, I think it's a real testament then when, there's new, when you said Mad Yolks is only a new business and already they're doing this. They've got that social... Uh, peace, that social mission that's there. I think that, that's something that's, a, that's brilliant, but also a testament to your partnership approach. And I think for my kind of first question, uh, I was kind of thinking like, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has to go on behind the scenes in setting up a business full stop. Um, 
But why a social enterprise? Why do you not go down the commercial route or, you know, why, why a social enterprise? Eileen, maybe I'll start with you first. Um, well, if I had have known, if you had have told me um, beforehand, I probably wouldn't have done it. No, I, I wouldn't have done it. So we, we went in blindly, thank God, but I wouldn't change it for the world. Like, it's... It, it just kind of happened by accident and what keeps us going is like the work we're doing, the impact we're having, the stories we hear. Um, yeah, because it can be really difficult. Like the, We're kind of a team of five now. We all work our own jobs yeah. and we do this and with growth and like we, the last program we ran was with Tusli. So the compliance that went with that, the work that went into even being able to go and work with them was just way more than we could probably realistically handle. If we had it thought about it properly, we yeah. wouldn't have done it. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? That was one of the most amazing programs. After mm. when we finished, the feedback was unbelievable. The young people in care that got to do our program was just phenomenal. So that just keeps us going. But realistically, <laughs> it's really hard. Okay. Um, okay, thank you, Eileen. Yeah, Libby, I might ask a question for you, and then I've got some other questions for you ladies at the end. Um, I think we just kind of chose a... It because um, we wanted to do something with hidden disabilities because it's very personal to mm -hmm. all three of us. And, uh, yeah, it just kind of happened, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, and I think it's interesting that, you know, you mentioned, Eileen, you know, it happened by accident. Um, and then, you know, it was just, for you, it was just like, oh, we just kind of, we kind of did it. And here's a question, to, I think, to all of you, like, how can we get more people, younger people like yourselves, with that very clear social idea or mission to see social enterprises as a real option? You said you kind of fell into it or, you know, happened by accident. How do, what, what do we need to do? And I think it comes back, I think it was Helen down here spoke earlier on about the training and education piece. You know, what do you think we might be able to do better to get more people in? That's for any of you. If anybody, Alwyn wants to take it. Yeah. Thanks, Alwyn. I think this is a really great question um, and the reason I, I feel compelled to answer is um, we got to take part in an accelerator program so we got to be kind of um, got to be exposed to a lot of businesses and I think um, and like startups and I think like the real kind of sexy startup to be in right now is that B2B SaaS like um, and that's kind of what people are attracted to but I think um, like the social enterprise model I think you know, and this is not to like offend, but you know, I think some young people might snooze at it because they think, you know, it's charity or it's, you know, you're not making any money or you're going to live a broke life, you know. Um, and I think being able to highlight like that there are a lot of incredibly um, like successful social enterprises like on a global scale whether that's like Tom's shoes or like at a local mm -hmm. scale like literally everyone here yeah. um, that uh, the social enterprise business model can be really successful and it doesn't have to be this kind of snoozed upon model or like that you're not going to make any money off that because as we all know that we're businesses at the mm -hmm. end of the day although there's a massive space for charities in this world and a uh, big advocate for supporting them but I suppose the difference with the social enterprise is that we we're a business that just has a social impact mm -hmm. and I think if we can communicate that message better to people they'll see that it's also a super sexy business to be in and we don't all have to do b2b SaaS. but yeah that's that would be my take on it Great, Alba, thank you, Mamawe. Do you want to come in? Yeah, can I add to that? I was just kind of thinking as to your question of like why social enterprise in the first place. And like for me, it's kind of like a head and heart relationship. Mm -hmm. I like to think of myself like I have the head of a capitalist but the heart of a socialist. So how do I navigate the two together? <laughs> so um, I really wanted to do something that had a social impact, but I wanted it to be sustainable and I wanted it to sustain itself. So I kind of just like fell into the social entrepreneurship world and fell into the social enterprise world as like a perfect like happy medium to, to how to get the impact that we wanted but also sustain ourselves. And as to how we can get um, people into, young people particularly, mm -hmm into social enterprise, I believe it's kind of like an empowerment thing. Mm -hmm. And then again, as you were saying, kind of showing them that it's something that you can actually live off this and it's something that um, you don't need to do as like a side hustle. Mm -hmm. Like for example, I know in my, in my own community that um, and as second generation migrants, a lot of like 
a lot of our career choices are kind of like leaning on our parents. Mm -hmm. And then if our parents see that, oh, you're just, you're, you're just in a charity <laughs> kind of thing, it's like it, it makes the young people feel like they, they can't actually do this for the long term. So I kind of, kind of let them know that this is something that your idea is actually important and it can be sustainable mm -hmm. and it can have a social impact at the same time. So it's actually creating that avenue to kind of educate the young people and their parents on having social um, entrepreneurship as an option for them. Brilliant. Yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic idea. And I think all of you bear that in mind for this afternoon when we're doing the kind of workshop session. Because I think, you know, we've had the Arise funding, we've had a number of different funding uh, uh, options where it is about promoting social enterprise. And who are we promoting that to? And I think, you know, the fact that all of you said you kind of fell into it by chance. What do we actually need to do to target new people coming into the sector because at some point, all of us in this room are going to exit it, you know? So I think that we do need that funnel effect. We do need for the ongoing social issues to be addressed by social enterprises. So if, if that's the case, Andrew, I hope you're taking note that, you know, the department potentially in the next policy needs to write in, how do we do that? How do we do that funnel impact? How do we get that across? So the likes of all yourselves feel that you're not falling into it by chance that it's actually something that you make an informed decision around, that you say, I'm doing this, I can have a sustainable life, I can not live on the red line, you know, uh, and that you can actually make this work, and more importantly, that you can get those commercial businesses to also partner with you, as you have already done in many cases. I, I've been told I'm not allowed to hog the floor, and I will come to your questions now in a moment, but I do kind of just have one, uh, and it's, it's all interlinked as to what we've already been talking about, but it is the supports that got you to where you are today. Like it's hugely important, especially when you're kind of feeling that you're falling into something you don't know, you've had this brilliant idea. So can I ask, maybe Livia, I might come to you first if that's okay. So what supports did you have in, you and your, and your fellow entrepreneurs have in thinking and, and managing the business plan even around L&M books? Um, yeah, well, our school was a big help at the start, and then um, the Fargan FD program, um, that was very helpful um, for us. And Tell us a little bit about that program, if you don't mind. What's, what's the NIFD program? Um, uh, uh, well, we did it for our mini company, for our school, so um, it was our transition year uh, program. So um, it was, um, yeah, sorry. Um, it was just like a co to help set up a company for like young Super. people, for teenagers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So you had support then from Faroaga and yeah. your school and you obviously found that hugely important. Yes, we did. Yeah, no, brilliant. So this was all set up as part of a mini company process. Yeah, um, brilliant. and then we took it further because we won and yeah. Yeah, and then you won. <laughs> Yay! Yay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, the Farragut team uh, sent me on like information obviously about L&M books and they sent me on the girls business plan and I was blown away by it. I was kind of going, my God. And actually, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, I should have checked this with you first, but uh, at the end of the year one kind of profit tax return, a charitable donation was put in and I just thought, my God, they are incredible people and for their parents that are here, you should be incredibly proud because um, it's not everybody who is who has that. So, thank you very much for that. So, <laughs> the other anybody else want to ask that one, answer that one about the supports? We had loads of support. We started off kind of voluntary, but then um, Dublin City Council saw what we were doing and gave us proper money to run <laughs> a proper course and then after that uh, it was introduced to Annabelle Conway and uh, Innovate Communities that gave us office space and mentorship which was like literally insane that she's the best <laughs> um, and then that we I got on the Common Purpose Emerging Leadership Programme and then SEI and then the Kevin Murphy so we've been lucky um, but we still need more. Yes, a oh very clear <laughs> message. Thank you, Eileen. Yeah, thanks for that. Mamobo, just pass it down there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that I was kind of like overwhelmed with support, um, <coughs> mainly educational, because I had no clue what I was doing. So um, I kind of got into the, um, the, the accelerator program for um, SCI, Social Entrepreneurs Ireland, and that's where I kind of learned 
what social entrepreneurship was um, and it kind of helped me develop my idea and then I got into a lot of different networks. There's one called Awake and Hope, it's a, a network for female founders. It kind of helped me um, understand the more commercial element of it and how to actually develop the, the business model around it, everything like that. And then I got into a leadership program um, called the Landecker um, Democracy Fellowship, which um, amplified young leaders in building democracy and bridging across differences. So they kind of funded and helped me kind of grow as an entrepreneur myself. And then recently we got um, the social um, enterprise fund from Ruth and Carlin to kind of help our social enterprise kind of um, start up and really develop. And one person particularly that I really um, got mentorship from and we have an advisory board as well is Claude O'Reilly, she's over there. She, she's kind of been a godsend to me. And um, she's, yeah, <laughs> she really kind of helped me kind of understand like, just how to even set up the whole social yeah. enterprise and she's been a huge soundboard as well when I'm kind of like very anxious so yeah there's been a, just a great amount of support and I'm really grateful for it as well and of course we need more too. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Albert are you okay? Can I, say, I forgot oh. ice as well. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just a very quick uh, we were very fortunate to get on to Launchbox which is the student accelerator uh, program in Trinity College me and my co-founder attend Trinity and um, I think for students, it was an incredible, incredible resource. Uh, there was I think and I knew everything. Uh, walking in like, oh, I know how to set up a business. I was clueless before the program. Um, so that, and we got a bit of funding from that, which is extremely beneficial to get us off the ground. And uh, since that's finished, um, I'm now part of Enactus, which uh, girls down there. <laughs> um, really um, great organization for students as well with um, social enterprises. So I think in, in terms of the supports for students, um, it's great to see the, the initiatives that Trinity has and the kind of in terms of a national and global um, level, the, the support from Enactus. Um, but definitely, it would be nice to know about what other supports are there, which is why I'm super happy to be here <laughs> to hear about everything because I think um, uh, obviously it's good to have the initiative to go out and search for these things um, mm -hmm. and where you can find support. But uh, it's often hard to find, or maybe I'm not looking in the right places. <laughs> um, but yeah, it definitely um, the advertising of those kind of funding supports and mentorship and all that, it's it, like invaluable even as you can see um, to each one of our businesses here getting external support because uh, when you have a small team, uh, it's nice to know when you've got people cheering you on that uh, you're doing a good job or like maybe do this instead, it's super, super beneficial. Brilliant, Alvin, thank you. I think um, before I come to the floor now, uh, you know, what you've all said is that you all had this huge level of support that was so important at various different stages of your startup. Um, but actually, you know, I come back to Michelle's point from earlier on, which is, you know, if we don't know where we find those supports, if they're not coordinated, if we don't know, and in particular for the younger generation, if, they, if younger people don't know about social enterprises that they even exist or what they're about, how can they know where the supports are? But again, I suppose that this is your first time to a National Social Enterprise Conference. You've survived the panel. Uh, I've survived it too. Um, you've survived the panel, but I think, you know, it, today is the day, and, and, and the group has put it out to you as, as an ask, a call to action, that we do need further partnership. We do need investment. We do need that collaborative working, which from my personal experience in my working life, it's the only way to go. Working in partnership, working in collaboration, not feeling you have to do it yourself. It doesn't matter how long you're doing it, you still need support at times. So I think to all of the, the, the ladies up here now today, that's a very clear message. So before I open it out, let's just give them one more round of applause. They're amazing. <laughs> so um, Andrew, I think, are you going to run around with a microphone? Oh, Sinead, well, thank you, Sinead. Any questions? Oh, yeah, okay, this, we've got two people with microphones. Any questions? All blown, just all into silence, just unbelievable. See, I knew I could have had more time asking questions. <laughs> See, told you. Anyone going to be, one question down here, yep. You might just say who the question's for or if it's a general question. Uh, no, it's for Levy. 
um, just about your books. So at the moment, where can you, can you buy your books at the moment? Um, and if so, where can you do that? Uh, no, not yet. We actually need to get it published um, first. Um, so that's our first step to get it published. But then definitely we really want to get it um, out on the shelf. So that's our step. Do you have a publisher? No. No. So anybody if anybody. Publishers? <laughs> very clear ask to the group or those who are joining us online. Here's an example of how you can very quickly and easily get uh, the, the dream of the girls up and running. So, yeah, I put it out there. But thank you, Libby, for that. And thank you for the question. Any other questions? Oh, down the back. Oh, Sorry, Norman first maybe, and then we'll go down the back. Sorry, Norman, I didn't see you over here. Thanks so much, and it's fantastic to hear each of your different stories. Just a quick question, because you're kind of in early stages of your development. Do you have a vision to go further than your respective counties? Are you thinking about expanding into Europe or further afield? Looking forward to hearing your Who'd insights. Who would like to answer that? Memo, but you want to go first? Yeah, so I have a mission of global domination. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think, it, particularly as a media company, there is so much opportunity. There are so many voices, so many communities, and so many people that are going uh, that are underrepresented, and are not having adequate um, channels for the voices and their sto stories to be told. So right now we are focusing on Ireland, of course, because we're based here. But obviously, Ireland is a very small country. Obviously, there's a lot of voices here that we need to see, and it's been such a journey hearing and learning from those different voices. But um, my goal is to actually develop our, our, through the work that we do in terms of education and learning, but develop our actual media platform to scale to Europe and the world, <laughs> but um, actually um, develop that platform to, to, to have. And what we're actually doing right now is um, creating a program where we actually develop the skills for young people of diverse backgrounds, because oftentimes they don't tell their own stories, but developing the skills for young people to understand how the media works and understand the creative media industry so they can obviously have the skills to develop their stories, develop their videos, develop their creatives to effectively put it on our platform and blast it out to the world but we obviously want to scale that program to get different voices from all around the world as well. So um, we are planning to actually get the stories of people who go unheard. I always say like nobody is voiceless and there's always this narrative that like oh, we're giving the voice to the voiceless. I say that nobody is voiceless. Everybody has a voice, but people just some people just don't have a platform to really use it or empower it enough to use that voice. So we, we want to create that space for them. Excellent. Wow, brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would like to answer that question. Um, just a world domination, same as Manobo. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, and thinking what she's saying, like the power of media and the power of people hearing your stories, like uh, we're already outside of Dublin and in Cavan, we've run programs in Cavan as well and interest all over. So that's in the plan. But um, the global award we won it sparked interest among other um, hairdressers and salon owners and distributors all over the world. And they're looking to see how um, Hair Together runs, how, how do we roll it out in their place? So we're actually working now we're with a guy in Italy, one of my close colleagues, that we're going to pilot it there. And um, we're in the middle of looking for some, some supports for that as well. So, yeah, world domination. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> there was one more question down the back here, yeah. Okay, this, um, hopefully it's going to be a quick one. Um, I'm just interested in knowing if you have put, it goes to all the panelists, uh, have you put thought into measuring social impact? Uh, is that a journey you're going through or is something that you have already matured and, you know, how was that journey to getting to that point? Thank you. Anybody want to answer that? Yeah, all went down there. Hi, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, absolutely. Uh, one of our biggest, like, KPIs, if you want to get technical with it, is like meals donated. Um, so in September alone, we did 1,096 meals. Um, so we're like, yes. <laughs> I'm super proud of that number. Um, and uh, always wanting to kind of track that and increase that. And especially now that we're looking into providing meals um, in Ireland, um, kind of seeing what our global impact and then what our local impact will be. 
uh, is super important. It's actually, it's really nice being a part of an actus because kind of measuring and quantifying impact is a really big um, kind of goal and thing that they uh, encourage us because um, without that, sure, how would we know what we were doing? Um, and it's really nice to give that feedback um, to our partners and to the you know consumers who are purchasing the meals to know that by doing this, you actually are having an impact. It's not just a, a flashy uh, charity washing um, marketing tool. Um, so that is that would probably be our top uh, KPI is meals donated. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think I think within the social enterprise sector, social enterprise sector overall, I think that we we can probably up our game in, in doing our social impact measurement. And, and showing uh, just what the impact that what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is having in the people in our communities. Uh, and, you know, as I said, personally, from my point of view, just seeing people who have a criminal history who feel that they will never get a job uh, to actually be given a real job in a real social enterprise is absolutely phenomenal. On a day-to-day -day basis, I hear from people who just say it has been transformative. And that's not just for the individual. It's for their families and communities. So that's just one quick example. I think, do we have one question over here? Was there a question? What was, sorry, what was that? Uh, oh, a comment, yep, yeah, sorry, yep. Yeah. The microphone's coming. Very good. Thank you for that. I think, again, it highlights that, you know, stuff doesn't happen in the vacuum that we do need support and, and the education system is hugely important, as are the likes of organisations like Faroga. We have run out of time. I'm so sorry. I, as I said, I could have been asking these questions all day, but uh, um, a, one big, huge, enormous round of applause, please, for our panelists. <laughs> Nibby, I'll get you to hang on here. Thank you all. Cheers. Yeah, you just stand in here. Um, we do have one final thing to do, and just to say we have a slight change to the schedule, so we will be going to lunch after this. You'd be pleased to know, because I know that we're all... <laughs> Tommy's grumbling, or maybe that's just mine. Um, I want to call up uh, the other two uh, entrepreneurs that worked with Livy, uh, Millie and Lucy. Um, <laughs> the incredible brains behind l and Books, which I have absolutely noted as a result of today, will have a publisher and will be on the, on, on the shelves. And I'd like to call up the employability manager with Faroaga, who's going to say a few words about the award that they got, and then Richard Gavin is actually going to present it with them. So, Caroline. Thanks so much, Vaughan. Thanks, everybody. And I suppose we thought it was very fitting to be here today to congratulate the girls. As Libby has explained, she, they are our national winners of 2022. So congratulations uh, in our best social enterprise. So, um, Absolutely fantastic. And, you know, I heard something lately that social enterprise is like the profit, you know, of uh, profit for soul, profit for soul. And these girls are the heart and soul and represent thousands of young people across the organization who are doing amazing work and really leading out for other young people. So you're amazing ambassadors. We could not do this without the support from Andrew and Richard in the department. Thank you so much because it allows young people to really have a voice and to lead out on this right across uh, right across the world because we've been back over the last two years as gold winners right across Europe in our European final. So it's been an amazing achievement and I just wanted to wish the girls the very best of luck in Vienna in September. Um, you're very proud parents and teachers here as well supporting you. So huge congratulations and you do us all proud and thank you very much for the support. Well done. <laughs> So what we wanted to do today was to invite Richard, I think is going to uh, present our trophy to the girls, our national winner for the best social enterprise 2022. So congratulations and thank you, Richard.
Thank you very much, girls. Cheers. Thank you for that. Thanks, Richard. Well done. And yeah, the very best of luck in September 2023. Thank you. You want to just take your seats there? Um, thanks. Cheers. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, I kind of landed that on Caroline at the last minute, so she did a, a stellar job of, of introducing that piece. It has come to lunchtime. Um, what I would say is this is the opportunity for you to really do that networking. If you, in particular with the panelists, as I said they're new to the social enterprise sector, they need our support. More, more um, importantly, we also need to hear from them and be re-energized if we've been in it for a while. Um, as I said, the lunch is happening now. After the lunch, we're going to get into the workshops. So get your brain thinking. The questions are going to be up on the screens. Uh, if, you have a, if you even have an opportunity to have a look at them, be thinking about your responses. Um, and then for those who are still following us online, the chat box is still open. Please do engage as much as you can. And we're going to be back in at 2 o'clock. 45 minutes, okay? So a quick lunch, 45 minutes. The main part is in the afternoon, the new beginnings, helping us to create that new strategy and policy for what comes next after this. So thank you very much for this morning. I have to bring you back to, back to plenary. I hope you enjoyed that. Are all the problems solved now? Yeah? Okay, great, great. No, being serious, I, I thought the, the discussions that I, um, that I witnessed anyway were, were uh, very, very rich and interesting. And I, I want to thank you all for giving so much uh, attention to it and, and providing such really helpful um, comments. All of those papers will be collected so please leave them on the table and we will be collecting them and recording them as part of our, our, um, our review. So I'm going to now give the floor to Siobhan who's going to elicit some feedback from all the tables. So thanks very much Siobhan. Um, thank you Andrew. Uh, yes that was a very interesting uh, walk around the room here in the challenges, the solutions, opportunities. Uh, so we want to be able to hear some of them. We want to put them back into the room for a wee bit um, we want for people who are joining us online to be able to hear some of them. I'm going to go around the room um, with said microphone. Um, audience participation, as like in a wedding, to come back to the original <laughs> reference this morning. Um, what I would ask is, it's just, if you have a look at, in response to question one, what is the most pressing thing that you'd like to get across from your table? challenge and solution okay as Andrew said the paper the, all the sheets are going to be uh, handed up uh, so they're not you, you're not going to miss the opportunity to have what you've taken time to think over discuss debate that is all going to be collected up 
So if we just, I'm, I'm going to be probably a bit ruthless around this because we all want to kind of get out um, at a reasonable time. So I'm going to go walk around, and this is this awful thing where everybody goes, oh God, she's looking at me. She's <laughs> looking at me. I'm going to go at this table first, if that's okay. Who's going to be your spokesperson? We're all going to be spokespeople, but one thing, um, it's so wonderful that there's such huge interest in social enterprise, and that's something to celebrate. But how do we make sure that the networks themselves collaborate? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that is a challenge. There are lots of networks who are serving yeah. social enterprises. So how do we make sure they collaborate and develop a strategy that works for all the social enterprises? Great. Yeah, thank you. All right. So what I will ask is if, there, if, you, if, that's, if your table has kind of said something similar, um, move on to something else. This is your opportunity to say something else as well. I'll pop this over here. Sheila, you're taking the mantle? Yeah, yes, we go. sure. Okay, so one of ours was attracting young people into the sector and retaining them, so having salaries that would keep them there. And we had a few solutions to that. One was including social entrepreneurship in the junior cycle and senior cycle of secondary school curriculum and having at least one question on the leaving cert about social enterprise in the business paper. Um, breaking down barriers about comprehension, so I suppose that's a bit awareness raising, understanding what is social enterprise uh, for, for aimed at young people. And then increased tax credits for individuals working in social enterprise. So if you work in a social enterprise, you pay lower PRSI. P nice. <laughs> that came from the accountant at the table, I have to admit. Um, and then increased enactus supports going on longer. Sorry, just say that Increased last enactus support, so for okay. students, that that would encourage students getting into social entrepreneurship. Excellent. All right. Who can top that? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Who's the spokesperson here? You. So I suppose what we're going to say probably leads on from the first point that was made. And so as a result of having all the separate representation, that there's an expectation on social entrepreneurs to give so much time um, out of what is an already stretched week to, I suppose, meet the requirements for funders. So if that's events, publicity, etc. Um, and I think because there's so many different bodies, there's not a realisation of how much is being asked yeah. of somebody in one week. Yeah. Do you have a solution for that? Um, <laughs> I suppose just probably if it, there was more cohesion around the, okay. the top part and then maybe if there was some sort of funding for time being given because often you're not being paid for the work you're doing in any way. So. Yeah, brilliant point. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers for that. So answers, challenges, solutions, question one. Mary's taking us up. Um, one of the ones we looked at was uh, greening uh, social enterprises and, you know, looking at the supports that are there, say, through the local enterprise office for commercial businesses, ensuring the same supports are there for social enterprises. So there's a Green for Micro, uh, which is two days free consultancy mm -hmm. with a green consultant that would allow the social enterprise to start identifying whether it's solar panels that they can put on their roof, uh, whether that could be part of their income streams or whether there's other design elements. Are they going to be a, a circular social enterprise? How are they going to transition? Um, and we just thought there would be great opportunities there for the social enterprises as a sector to, you know, to really embrace the greening of, of, uh, of social enterprises and uh, try and ensure that the, the right supports are there uh, to help them. Uh, so that we, we covered a lot of things, but that was just, just one point. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I think especially now with the cost of energy, utility bills, everything, I think that, yeah, I think the greening of the sector would be hugely important. And I'll just take this moment to say that, you know, to add in that social value piece or that socially responsible public procurement, it shouldn't be done with the exception of green public procurement. In fact, when things work incredibly well is when GPP and SRPP are done together. So let's really start to push that. Andrew, that's for the strategy next time. Who is speaking at this table? Here we go. Thank you. Yeah, so we're an optimistic bunch. We Great, think that, yeah. brilliant. Uh, we're kind of confident that the challenges will be met. Um, we think there will be an improved, increased uh, funding, uh, both at national and uh, European level. We think there is a definite and real shift of business attitudes to sustainability and social impact. And there is lots of social work to be done in the areas of the just transition from fossil fuels 
flexible working, new ways of working, rural living, new, better childcare, elder care and welfare. There's a real opportunity now to go global with uh, social enterprises, with uh, access to ICT. And one that uh, a lot of people talked about here is a real desire, particularly in Gen Z, about personal growth, quality of life, uh, living a sustainable lifestyle. So lots and lots of opportunities for social entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurship. And uh, it requires what other people talked about, a change of mindset and uh, a different way of measuring impact of businesses. Yeah, super. Thank you. That is a very optimistic table for this time of the day. OK, over here. Who's speaking? No. Thank you. I think I am by default. Um, <laughs> but uh, just, yeah, I tried to just cover one or two we haven't spoken about. Um, I think one of the things to consider, a potential challenge over the next few years as well, is if you're simulating the ecosystem and generating more ideas, how you manage mergers potentially going forward. Um, there's going to be, there are, at times, will be ideas out there that are quite similar in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. So from the department's point of view, how do we help kind of uh, stimulate an awareness there and bring people together, as I am in particular, as one organisation has been fairly good at doing it. Yeah. Um, so just something to consider there. The other things as well around kind of the stimulation of uh, ideas that have are more limited companies, if, they're, if there's IP behind it or, mm -hmm. or, or like uh, technical ownerships of, of some softwares, if the founder moves on, yeah. say, for example, how is that managed and that the right kind of structures are there for it as well. So um, is there any other ideas, guys? No. I'll go with that. Brilliant. Thank you. You did a super job despite being nominated by your other, other members of the table. Okay, over here, Stuart, you're being pointed to. Uh, yeah, look, I think most a lot of stuff has been mentioned already that came up at uh, this table as well, but a very simple one, uh, but quite a big one, but a really important one, would be uh, the scrapping of VAT on uh, the circular economy. Right. Very good. Thank you. Now over to this table. Who's your day? Thank you. Um, one of the ones we came up with was the opportunity with diverse communities um, to look at how they approach um, the whole area of social enterprise. Um, and just to basically involve them in the whole thing. Um, recently I was at an Ivy Trust talk, the first inaugural talk on Community Connector. There was a one diverse people and 150 people there. Um, and it, it just showed that kind of, I'm not saying, I'm criticizing the Ivy Trust, but it's just that there is so much opportunities there for social enterprises to work with them and to develop maybe products or services for that group of people. Um, the other one, and some may, may people disagree with this, but I, I work in the rural areas um, in South Wicklow and there's been a, an improvement in broadband and that has helped, for example, social enterprise to develop services for people active aging. Um, and I think it's just an op a new opportunity in rural areas for um, that population. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay. We come. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, so we spoke about the fact that policy alignment could be improved across the government. Uh, and the potential solution for this was a specific junior ministry for the social economy. Um, we spoke a lot about like burnout of founders during the startup phase and the general kind of increase in the cost of doing business for smaller social enterprises. And we spoke about the potential for shared services cooperatives, where you know they handle bookkeeping, admin, HR, and let founders and managers focus on generating value and not doing administration. And we spoke a lot about like the fragmented social enterprise support system at the moment, and a lot of this was being driven by the current kind of annual kind of core funding supports and the solution was to adopt longer term uh, support contracts and funding arrangements for social enterprise support organizations. And then in terms of opportunities, um, we spoke about the credit union movement and its interest in the social economy space, its membership ethos and asset base. And possible next step was just yet yeah, to, just to do more to kind of integrate the, that movement into the social enterprise space. Uh, we spoke about the fact that there's a lot more awareness around social enterprise now and that this was a potential competitive advantage for social enterprises. Next steps, I made this up guys, but um, mo more arise type activity in, in the coming years. And then one that we spoke about briefly was just the new, the new cooperative legislation uh, that's coming down the track. The general scheme was published yesterday and the opportunity to kind of make sure that legislation is optimized for social enterprises in the future. So. That's us.
Brilliant. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for that. Okay. I'm coming behind you here, guys. Sorry. My okay. apologies. Ivan. Thanks, Siobhan. Uh, thanks, Most of the things uh, mentioned at this point, but just uh, uh, two um, social enterprises face a sustainability challenge just like other businesses will face. Okay. Mm -hmm. So while there are opportunities in it, special supports will be needed to assist in decarbonizing social enterprises just as much as those will be required by uh, regular businesses, so to speak. Um, then there is another one in relation to the general inflationary supply chain risk that all businesses, again, are currently facing. So we need to remember the lessons that were learned during COVID. Solutions need to be rolled out simultaneously across all government departments and agencies that work with uh, funded organizations and service providers and um, social enterprises so that they have the additional money they will need to cope with inflation. The points have been made about retaining staff and holding talent, which mm -hmm. is the biggest single issue. But if the money isn't there to do it, it's, it's potentially really, really serious. So, yeah. thank you. Brilliant. I have a very good point to make there. Thank you. Um, now, come to this table here. So, does we recognize that there was a gap in gaining and retaining talent when we don't necessarily have the resources to hire these people, especially when it comes to rising costs of living, people are going with the larger salaries. So as um, a potential solution, we talked about mutual aid in the social enterprise sector, mm -hmm. so sharing of skills and services, maybe on a pro bono or in exchange for services that might suit each other. Great, thank you very much. Has everybody, uh, did every, this table here? Sorry, my apologies. How could I forget, Emma? I was, I was voluntold to do this, so um, <laughs> I'm. Uh, I like it. <laughs> so we, we uh, I think everybody used up a lot of the good ones there, but yeah. uh, a lot of what, what we talked about kind of came back to capacity building and skills. A lot of uh, the challenges that uh, organisations are facing. So things that we talked about were things like uh, grant writing, uh, vision and clarity, and plans to scale, um, uh, uh, accessing funding. Um, was other one, uh, pitching and selling and those yeah. kind of skills that aren't, you know, a lot of the people get into the social enterprise sector because they care about the issue mm -hmm. and not necessarily because they have those business skills. Yeah. So there's a lot that could be done around bringing more business skills or kind of private sector skills into mm -hmm. the social enterprise sector. Um, so I think that was it, yeah. unless anybody... Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. I did get every table today. Oh, there's some online. Yeah, hang on, I'll pass this over to you, Richard, and then you can read them out. <laughs> I'm definitely getting my steps in now. Yeah, yeah just, just uh, a couple of suggestions from a John O'Connor came through the online, the, the WebEx, and they were suggesting participatory governance and also the need for a, a model for impact measurement. Great. Yeah, thank you, John, yeah, for contributing online. So just before I move on to the second question, I get a repeat of what, we've, what I've just done there. I mean, some really kind of commonalities in some of the stuff that was being said. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that we have to bear in mind is the fact that, and we mentioned this throughout the day, is that, you know, being, uh, running a social enterprise, setting up a social enterprise, being an employee in a social enterprise can be very difficult, like in any business. It's, it can be extremely draining. It can be very challenging. It's only going to increase with the challenges, as Ivan has pointed out. I think that successor planning piece, so once that top person goes, the whole thing doesn't fall apart. What we saw on this panel earlier on was extreme talent. We have to be able to attract talent. Um, in order to be able to attract talent, we have to be able to pay fairly, so thank you for that point, and kind of a couple of other people did it as well. Okay, second question is about opportunities. And how do we really tap into them? You know, we're full of opportunities here. We, we're, that's what connects us all within the social enterprise sector. But how do we actually make them a reality? Okay, so I'm going to start at the back of the room today at this question, should I say? Stuart, I'm coming to you, just because I saw you on your phone. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I think um, the opportunities, I would hope that would be uh, meaningful procurement opportunities from uh, state uh, bodies. Uh, I know that Minister McEntee from Justice did talk about in a meaningful way, hopefully, that 15% of all the Department of Justice procurement uh, could be offered out to social enterprises. 
Uh, and I think that's really the, that would be a game changer yeah. for us. Fifty percent would be hugely ambitious. It was ten percent, well, but that's 15, okay. Fifty. <laughs> we'll negotiate. 15. No, thank you. But I think the procurement piece is something that we, we really need to work on. Okay, who's doing? Yep. Oh, back over. Now opportunities, and then how do we make them a reality? Um, one of the opportunities came up um, was the whole area of digital transition and the whole area of digital transformation, and to some way recruit very talented people in that area because usually a lot of them will ha have um, very good wages etc um, and probably some way we're saying the recession uh, hopefully won't come but if it does that there will be a silver line in terms of maybe there will be more staff there who are willing to maybe go into into this area um, but just in that whole aspect to really bring maybe social enterprises in the area of very high level digital work excellent thank, thank you, you very much cheers Anybody speaking? Are you doing the opportunities? <laughs> Sam, has, Sam has left the building. Yeah. I don't think I can um, understand. That's okay. No, don't worry. We can pick your paper up then afterwards. But thank you. Ivan? Okay. Yep. There's a, a few here, Siobhan. So Great. we felt that there's lots of opportunities in relation to business to business trading within the sector. Clearly, there's uh, loads of business-to-business -business opportunities between the sector and other sectors like Stuart's indicated in relation to procurement. Also, the insight we had was, you know, commercial businesses are becoming more like social enterprises through the whole ESG kind of strategy thing. So we think there's opportunities for social enterprises to model what being ESG really means, almost like positioning social enterprises as the core of kind of sustainable approaches to how we organize and understand work and business. Um, so I think that's the main thing. SE kind of doing itself out of business by becoming the mainstream way that business is done, if you see what I mean, almost Very like good. that. Yeah. yeah, lovely. Thank you, Ivan. Now over to this table. I'm going to shimmy through here. Um, I'm like, oh. Over here. Thank you. So um, we had a couple of opportunities. One was that at the moment there aren't enough, um, I'm going to say, champions, uh, so social enterprises who've really reached the pinnacle of what they can achieve, which is kind of a template for others to follow. Um, there are some great social enterprises, obviously, but, but what we need to do is maybe develop it. it we talked about a, in the private sector, you have a top talent yeah. program for your, you know, your top mm -hmm. talent, and you invest in them, and you develop programs, and then the idea is you bring them up, and then they, in turn, will bring others up. So we were thinking a program like that for social enterprises. Um, one of the other opportunities that we talked about was tapping into the Gen Z. Um, there is much more of an interest now in social issues among younger people and we need to tap into that. And we talked about maybe developing a program like the BT Young Scientist, which um, the yeah. talent that is in that program is unbelievable for, mm -hmm. for the age of the participants. So mm -hmm. developing something like that with the same level of visibility and investment so yeah. that you're able to make social enterprises appealing um, and tapping into that, that need younger people have to do something that has a social impact. Yay, great. I think that's, Thank you. that's more or less it. That's a Thank super you. idea. I love the idea of the, the BT award. Yeah, great. And actually, just to say, um, earlier this week, I attended an event at the Rediscovery Centre. Social Impact Ireland were hosting it, and it was the first awarding of the social enterprise mark. Um, so again, that kind of showcasing, that like top of the class, um, you know, and that mark then is, is a validation to businesses to say that this social enterprise operates to the highest level possible, like every other business. Uh, and just because we're a social enterprise doesn't mean that we don't have all of the other requirements that you have. In fact, we work harder because we've got a social mission. I'm really delighted to say that the Rediscovery Centre were one of the recipients of that first award. Seven social enterprises were awarded. So, round of applause for Sarah, who's here. <laughs> Are you doing this again? Okay, great. Um, so, we identified the fact that social enterprises are the perfect vehicle for corporates to implement their CSR policies. And that, with, again, with the rising costs of living and energy, that social enterprises are almost in a position to teach corporates how to reach their SDGs at this stage. So I think getting readiness within the sector and building capacity to meet that, that need would be very beneficial for the social enterprise sector. Super, thank you very much for that. Mary, are you up again? Thank you. We, we had a few um, points on the opportunities um, 
one of the pieces, and it's probably been touched on, is is just the lack of uh, you know time to know what grant opportunities are coming along. So we think there's an opportunity to flag up you know, a, a better uh, sense of the road ahead so that social enterprises can be better prepared to, to respond uh, to those opportunities and any way that that could be maybe shared in one, one platform or a, a way that it's easier for people to find. Um, we, we think there's a huge opportunity around the digitization um, of, of the social enterprises and something as simple as a CRM system and maybe an opportunity for the sector to work more um, collaboratively, maybe with a corporate that has expertise in that area and whether a particular system that's more bespoke to the needs of social enterprises, because there have been some um, initial stages, but the systems aren't really understanding the needs of the social enterprise. So rather than each having to go out and procure their own, maybe funding to really do a detailed analysis of the needs. And I think the census now of those 800 will give a better understanding of um, where, where would you start. Um, we were also talking about boards and um, there was a conversation about someone who wanted to join a social enterprise and then um, a connection was made. But we feel that the people who are on boards could maybe champion it within their own industry so particularly if they're bringing a financial expertise or a marketing expertise that you know whether that's talking to their colleagues to say look you might know but this is something i do if you want to meet me for coffee you know different ways and other ways to have kind of matched events uh, where social enterprises would meet people who are maybe just curious about what would it look like if i if i joined a board um, so uh, and the overall piece we just feel is the ambition to grow the social enterprise sector as part of the economy over the next five years and maybe set a target yeah. as to the level of, of growth uh, we want to see there and some of the procurement and other issues and capacity building would build that. And then the final one was just around the role social enterprises could play around the future jobs and where there are gaps in the market. So we were talking about farriers and maybe working with members of the travel community who have that skill set. Um, there, it could be some of the um, retrofitting uh, requirements or, you know, a beekeeper. So there's kind of examples of this across the sector, but is there a way the social enterprise sector can be identified as a place where those future skills needs are being supported and, and developed? So I think that's just a few. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, I'll come to this group here. Sorry, Sarah, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, we, we were talking a lot about the opportunities around um, kind of corporate partnerships as well and looking at ESG or CSR. And I suppose one of the things we, we touched upon is that social enterprises aren't always best equipped to develop those partnerships. And that, you know, there's, they can be very complex. Um, there can often be a lot of social washing and, you know, sometimes it doesn't really work for the social enterprise. So. We felt perhaps a solution could be some sort of facilitated program between, maybe it's like a public-private partnership mm -hmm. where you have the private sector working with government, working with social enterprises, and maybe that's something that brilliant. could be developed. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Now, this table. Oh, now, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, so we had a few ideas, but I'm just going to talk about two in particular. Um, one of them is that given the current kind of, um, I suppose, energy instability and energy prices that people are facing, that there's a really good opportunity there to kind of build back better and mm -hmm. increase, like, you know, um, support for, like, local energy co-ops uh, to increase energy stability that way and have, you know, our energy system run by communities on behalf of those communities. That would result in better stability and then so also um, better stability in prices then as well. Um, also, if there was some sort of initiative or structure put in place to um, kind of incentivize SMEs into converting into social enterprises, uh, and an example of that would be in the US where if uh, uh, um, companies are going bust, uh, the workers have the opportunity to actually purchase those companies and run them on a social enterprise cooperative basis. So if we could follow that, that would be great. Super, great idea. Yeah. Um, Norman? Thanks. Okay, so one of the things that we were discussing is obviously the, the old saying, there's no strength without unity, and we think there's mm. fantastic opportunities for social enterprises to be promoted collectively um, through awareness campaigns, like the great example this week, the Buy Social campaign, more of that, through publications, through social media, 
to engage with younger audiences, so this could even be through TikTok dances, I'm told. <laughs> um, but we need to be agile, we need to be able to respond to the new ways that folks are communicating, or it could be through digital brochures, through events, through academia, and so on. One of the other areas we talked, on, talked about resonates with some of the lovely comments that we're hearing mm -hmm. from overseas, from the OECD and the European Union perspective, is how Ireland is, a, it seems to be a, a bit of a standout, like we, we're, we are doing a lot of good in this space, and so uh, we think there's opportunities for almost like global standards to be set for Ireland to be seen as a real leader in this space. And following on from that, for Ireland to be an attractive place for social enterprise FDI to want to set up and start. We've been incredibly successful attracting major tech companies into Ireland, but how about we have that ambition to attract major social enterprise tech companies or major international social enterprises to set up their EM, EA headquarters in Dublin or in Ireland or whatever. And one final point is that we would um, aspire to help our social enterprises have that ambition to internationally scale, to expand, to export as well. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you. Norman has volunteered to do the first TikTok video. Yeah. Um, we all heard that, didn't we? Um, I haven't come to... Oh, we're coming over here again. Well, you yeah, can add. Yeah, yeah you can okay. add. This is the optimistic table. They only did the second question. So now we have to be optimistic that they have more yeah, we're different optimistic. answers. Yeah, I'll be super, super optimistic. Um, yeah, I think genuinely... Uh, have lived long enough to see changes in Irish society. I think there is honestly uh, a real commitment across mm -hmm. all sectors of Irish society that we have a more sustainable and equitable society. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is a fertile ground for social entrepreneurship to flourish. Yeah. And if all we have to do is get the structural sort of supports in place for it, I think I'd be really optimistic in the next decade that we will be a global leader in uh, social entrepreneurship. So they are my positive. Very good. Sort of yeah. Very good. Yeah. This is the final table. We're, we're nearly done. I think we've covered quite a bit anyway. Um, so I'm not sure I have too much to contribute. There's probably a piece around um, an opportunity and stronger collective messaging. You know, kind of days like today kind of show the interest um, internally within the sector as well. But given the impact of the rise, might have had, but it showcased an impact a bit more as well and results on, a year, on, a, on an end year basis potentially. Because mm -hmm. um, I think it's uh, around the definition of social enterprise is one thing, but it's very hard, it's very, it's easier to sell it to someone when you actually show them when it's happening either at a macro level, but also in their back, back garden mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a real opportunity there. And as well as that then, the alignment to a kind of um, ethical consumerism, which is coming out with, with Gen Z a bit more and more as well. Um, but yeah, I've not really uttered that. Then, Excellent. But. No, thank you very much. Um, all incredibly valid, excellent points. Uh, I, sorry, did I get everybody? Richard, is there anything that came in? No. No, okay. I'm just going to leave that microphone there if that's okay. Um, what an incredible session. I know as social enterprise people that you probably could have stayed there talking about that for quite a long period of time. Um, but we are coming towards the end, so I'm going to ask Andrew Ford to wrap up for us. Thanks, Siobhan. <laughs> so um, I, just to, to echo what Siobhan said, I, that was uh, incredibly insightful. Um, uh, and it just shows you the power of uh, tapping into the collective um, experience in a forum like this. So I want to sincerely thank you for, for that. Um, and I want to reiterate that all of those papers and all, all that you've said has been recorded, will be recorded, and will be taken on board as we move forward. Um, uh, what, I, what I meant to say earlier, but I didn't, didn't I suppose, give a complete answer, was around uh, the next steps um, in this process uh, and where we go from here. I'd like you to consider this the start of a conversation today. Um, we have had some bilateral contact with some networks and, and others, uh, but, but really this is the formal start of the conversation. Over the coming number of months there will be events uh, organised by, uh, by our partners throughout the country. I think Letterkenny next week, I think uh, Cork sometime in February, there are a variety of different places all over the country. Um, events such as these, uh, but possibly it will allow uh, even more chance to drill down and, and to, to get your, your input. But there are two other pieces of the puzzle. Um, and, and we've discussed them briefly earlier. One is the OECD report, um, which is 
exceptionally important for us because it, it, it sort of holds a mirror up to Ireland's experience and says, you know, here are the gaps and here are the opportunities and, and does it, as you saw from Amal, Amal's presentation earlier, in a way that is uh, experience-based and draws on the experience of others. And that's what we need to be doing. Um, we, we, we should not approach this process looking at what we have and seeing how we can move a step or two forward. We should really be dreaming about what we can make of this sector. There are other countries in Europe that there are, you know, uh, instead of having a private hospital um, sector, they have social enterprise hospitals. Um, you know, instead of having private insurance, they have cooperatives and social enterprise insurance companies that, you know, aren't out to maximise profit. So, so let's be... Let's be ambitious. And several people have talked about the idea of community energy. It's, it's clearly a huge opportunity. We see that already now. Uh, more and more of the community energy um, organizations are social enterprises. Probably, and um, Joanne is down there, she knows better than I, um, or John, uh, you know, many of the remote working digital hubs in this country are, are trading as social enterprises. So, so let's, not be, let's not be tied down by, by, by what we have experienced and let's think about what, what, where we can go. So the first thing is, this, is the OECD report. The second thing then is, is the um, data collection exercise, which uh, again, thanks to you all who've taken part in that process and we're really pleased to have partnered with them, SERI, ILDN and Amorok Research. Uh, that, 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 that the report that comes from that will give us a picture um, of the social enterprise sector in this country, what uh, areas of business uh, social enterprises are working in, the level uh, um, of, of um, people they're, they're, they're employing, um, the, the, the geographic penetration, um, and so on and so forth. But, it, but it's not going to be absolute, and it's really important that we know that. It will paint a picture, but we need to build on this. And this is the first instance. It'll give us a very solid evidence base, but we need to continue to build on it. Um, with all of that, we should be in a position to draft a policy and prepare a public consultation in the first half of next year with a view to the policy being adopted by government by the middle of 2023 in an ideal world. But as I say, and I keep saying it, I'm sorry to repeat myself, we need you to be involved in this process because that's the only way we'll actually develop something that is really fit for purpose. So open door, okay? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it there. It's half past three. I want to sincerely thank all of you for, uh, first of all, the speakers who spoke today, who were just phenomenal. And I have to, in particular, uh, th thank the, the young people who spoke before lunch. That just blew me away. I don't know what you're involved with. Um, I, I want to also thank our fantastic AV colleagues, Colin and Sean, top class guys. Um, uh, obviously, my team are, you know, have, been, have done a fantastic job. If I can just really do point to John Ryan, who often is, uh, doesn't, doesn't say very much, but he's plowing away, <laughs> designing all this, making it all happen. So thanks, John. And thanks to all the team, of course. Uh, uh, and I, I, I described her as my co-conspirator this morning. Isn't she just brilliant? Siobhan Cafferty. Um, and, and very last word, my sincere thanks to you all, and I wish you a, a very good evening, and I look forward to working with you over the coming months and developing the new policy. Thank you. Thank you.